Late good morning everybody. I'm about to crack into fall streak again because I want to know what the heck is going on in this game. Because this dude has some mad writing skills and I'm hoping his ending will be awesome. Don't just standing there narrating. Do something at day? I don't know how to say her name. At Elise. So I guess it'd be Addy or Addy something. Any time to sleep between helping care for the children or craft in school. If I were to describe her in a short little title, it would be Unreliable Moral Compass. What kind of title is that? That doesn't taste like lasagna. Zanya. <laughs> what a word. <laughs> I can't read. After coming to the conclusion that Lorona was indeed not lasagna, Yoletta finally lets go. But trying to eat people is bad, okay, Noletta? Questionable. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, good morning, lasagna. Uh oh. Lorona, not lasagna. You're confusing her, Addy. Good morning, lasagna. I'm having an identity crisis. There, there. I give lasagna a pat pat on the noggin and she curls up and cradles her head. It makes you feel any better. You go well, pretty well with garlic bread. Ooh. The sad sound like air escaping from a balloon. Lasagna deflates into the ground. Well, nothing to see here. Oh no, no. Letta seems curious about Lasagna's newly acquired two dimensional state. She follows after me as I make to leave the scene. Together, the two of us enjoy a nice, relaxing stroll to school. Don't just leave me behind! As the three of us travel alongside a stream that went that went winds towards our destination, we happen upon a dead wayfarer. Ah, uh, how can you tell the difference between winds and winds between, besides context clues? Jesus, what the hell? She got blood on her face. Something's going on. Come on, Tris, can noodle the ground some other time, or she's got scars. A displeased girl could be seen impatiently tapping her foot. Besides the corpse in question. It's easy to see why he had succumbed. The absurd amount of project gear was trapped to his back, enough that it practically buried his prone figure. Ah, poor Trish, you shouldn't rush him. He, he's carrying your stuff. Do, Kalia. Just carrying my usual bag! The rest is junk I told him to left behind. Leave behind. He always brings a bunch of garbage we actually never actually use. Whenever we have projects, jeez. As Lorona begins liberating Triss from his burden, Noletta crouches down next to his hand, body, stretches out her hand. Ah! The hand halts as the body in question suddenly stirs and rises to its feet. It's alive! It's alive! Watch out, Noletta, it's a zombie! Zombie? Three animated cor corpse that likes eating human people brains. Trying to eat people is bad, Mr. Zombie. Oh, <laughs> Faced with Noletta's inexplicable astonishment, Tris seemed to be at, seemed at a loss. Hope you enjoyed your nap! These two were the 11 year old Lyric twins, Kalia and Tristan. Though we make an effort to walk to school together, the Lyrics were habitually late, making they a rare occurrence where all five of us were present. As for why Triss was carrying Callie's bag in addition to his own load, it was simple. Callie had, oh, had no arms to speak of below the elbows. That's why her arms are down like that. Oh my god, look at that. That's unfortunate. Wounds from the fire of collapse that began, befell nine years ago. There were many in Socotrine who bear, bore similar disfigurations. That's sad. Triss as well had not remained unscathed. The smoke from the prismatic flames of that day had stripped him of his voice, rendering him mute. They were heavy scars, yet they never seemed to weigh down the Lyric twins. Always on the move, with new things happening in their presence all the time, it made me want to continue watching them, see where they go and where they might take me. Because they complete each other! Wow, spring's really showing its full colors early this year. 
Wandering over to a wayside willow, Lorona marvels at the bed of flowers nestled under its eaves. Aha, I know. Over here, Noletta. Lorona waves Noletta over after picking several flowers from a particularly bountiful patch. Question? I'm going to reach, teach you something nice, so listen up. Taking Noletta hand, Noletta's hand in hers, Lorona threads a flower between her fingertips. One way to show people you care about them is to place a flower in their hair like this. Whoa, mind blown. Gently handing Noletta's hand, handling Noletta's hand. Lorona guides the flower up and through her carroty locks. Get it? After examining her newly changed appearance for a bit, Noletta nods. You understand this? Show me. Oh, she gone. Butcher this. Lorona entrusts the rest of the flowers to Noletta with a smile. Oh, does she already have a flower up there? Oh, she gonna do it to them. After gazing at the flowers for a while, Noletta seems to come to some sort of conclusion. Calia, Triss, I care about you. Oh, look, they got the flowers. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You don't have to listen to everything Lorona tells you, you know. In contrast to Callia's flusher reaction, Triss expresses himself in a heartfelt bow as if he had been graced by an angel. Guess it's my turn next. You ain't getting no flower! As <laughs> Noletta reaches out with the last remaining flower, though, cast with a spell of whimsy. At the last moment, I tilt my head to the side, causing her to miss. That's rude. Noletta attempts <laughs> Rude! Stop! Noletta attempts to place the flower in my head again. But I pull away once more. You won't let me? Nope. Let me. Undeterred, Noletta tries to put the flower in my head again. Noletta can be quite stubborn at times, but I just don't feel like letting her have her way. The last remaining flower. Hmm? Okay, fine. With a shrug, I stop moving and keep still. Now everybody's got flowers. Let's go, flower power squad. Just as she's about to thread the steam through my hair, I pluck it out of her hand, reaching up and setting it up upon her snow white tresses instead. Ah. Putting a finger to her lips, I stick my tongue out at her. Okay, I got it. Gotcha! I smile and wink triumphantly. I was about to say, is this getting dirty? Oh, she's pissed! Uh-oh, she looks pretty upset. A pale white flower suits you far more than me anyways. After puzzling my words over my words for a moment, she, Noletta quietly nods to herself. I need to find a flower that suits Addie. With our powers combined, we are Flower Planet! How sad. It seems there aren't any flowers left around here for picking. Ready for picking. I'm going ahead. She's looking for flowers. Wait, Triss still needs help carrying this stuff. You help him. But no, that doesn't seem to help. Here. <sighs> Addie, Kalia, could one of you lend us a hand? Changing a glance with me, Kalia dangles her empty sleeves with a shrug before skipping off ahead. This calls for immediate base of action. You got this big sis, Lerona. <laughs> Nabbing my index fingers at her, I turn on my heels and bolt. <laughs> hey! Don't only pull the big sis card when it's convenient. <laughs> Upon catching up to Callie's side, I slow to a stroll. As if in agreement that we had witnessed nothing, the two of us mosey along in silent solidarity. Solidarity. <laughs> then, though I have to say, it's pretty fun how funny how good of a mood a let a simple act put has put Callie in. You know, it's not just Noletta. We all care about you. Bending forward to get a good angle on her face, I gaze into Kalia's eyes. I care about you too. What? Sh shut up! I'm not stupid. You're just trying to tease me again like you always do, Sundar. You're such a little troll. <laughs> How dare you? I am a sweet young girl. Thirsty. Still, though. I wonder why this always ha seems to happen. <sighs> Up ahead, Noletta was poking through the bushes in search of flowers. Oh god, he's dead! Oh, what was that noise? <laughs> Far behind, Lorona and Jess were floundering around under the weight of their cargo. 
Under the promise of, promise of budding trees, we once again fall to the tra fail to travel to school as a proper group of five. <laughs> that dude died, bro. Oh, whoa. This is a nice schoolhouse. The drawings, and I don't know if they like got these sprites for somewhere or these backgrounds, but they look really good. This is good, well done. Despite our morning antics, we somehow managed to arrive at school early. Upon entering the one classroom building, an array of empty desks meets us save for one. Oh, God, okay. I missed the illuminating light of early morning. She was there. Is that the teacher? A young woman whose presence had held a mysterious allure to it. With immaculate form and perfect posture, she sat on moving at the far, one of the far side desks. Mm. Excuse me. Good morning, Erwina. Hey, Erwina. Hello, Addie. Alia. Angling her head in one direction, in our direction, Erwina returns our greeting with a vague nod. Well, I knew Erwina was the oldest student at the school. Oh, well, she's not a teacher. It was difficult to get a good read on her age with how her eyes were always bandaged over. A flower that suits Addie. Addie, I couldn't find one. Ah. Ah. We made it. <laughs> Noletta, Lorona, Tristan as well. But then again, <laughs> as if taking his cue, Tristan summarily kneels over and kisses the ground. That's a nice way, an elegant way to put that. Don't mind him. That's just Tris being the usual drama queen. <laughs> he dies quietly because he's mute. <laughs> I see. Something felt different about Erwina today. Get it? She sees because she's blind. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> okay. She felt absent minded. I should laugh about that, but there, it's a video game. I can laugh about it. Leave me alone. Her response is some too lacking the a usual self-possessed weight. Has something troubled you out, Wena? Now that I think about it, wasn't it odd she was sitting back here at this back row desk? Feel free to tell us about it. I love to meddle, you know. You're quite perceptive, aren't you, Ade? With a light chuckle, Erwina traces her finger across the surface of the desk before her. It's true that I have something on my mind. As you may know, none of these desks in the back row are currently in use. Everyone occupies a some spot in the world in terms of space and resources. However, it is not as though the school is lacking in them. Even though possibility of filing these filling, filling in these vacancies exists, it remains unrealized. Erwina's idle hand motions to come to a stop. The voice takes taking on a mysterious tone. Strange feeling, this feeling that where someone could be, there is no one. What, are you, what is this deep tone? Stop. God, where someone could be, there is no one. You guys would be an insatiable amount of fun with hot. Elena's words conjure a certain image in my mind's eye. They're trying to go into that deep thinking kind of seminar. An image of her sitting here lost and thought all alone. Thinking, perhaps, of the absent warmth of someone who would have been here with us today had the cards fallen differently. Sorry, Erwina. There might be less space in the school than you think. If you look at the desk back there, you'll find they're all stuffed to the brim with books. Seems like the board of, board of some hopeless bibliophile. So yeah, we might not actually have any more room for new students. The heck? We don't get any new classmates because Addie's such a bookworm. I'm going mad. Is Addie the teacher? At least my books don't sell me out. <laughs> Woohoo! I suppose it would get rather cramped given how lively it already gets around here. I'll probably have to report the troublemaker using school property without permission, though. Take me away, officer. Aha! Uh -huh. I jest, of course. Schools are for learning, after all. And it's senseless to hit the hen for laying eggs. Now that I think of it, though, the five of you are here quite early today. Who's the teacher? That's right. We're really pumped for today's competition. Uh, Mr. Nehru. Mr. Nehru not here yet? In the row? It appears Lorona's attempting to resuscitate her fawn comrade has not 
have not been bearing fruit. So, <laughs> why not? Father will be arriving shortly. That's right, though a student in name, it was more accurate to say Erwina taught her alongside her father, if anything. Substitute teacher. Oh? Long have I awaited the day my students arrive early. Such is their enthusiasm to learn. <laughs> Mr. Nero, an eccentric individual who had constructed this school using his own fortune in the wake of the fire of collapse. The fact that he even personally taught was testament to his dedication to the next generation. Dedication to the next generation. Let's go. Look at that rhyme. I still remember his baffling self-introduction upon meeting everyone at the beginning of the school year. Let's go. Nero can be interpreted to mean white wings of learning. If it's difficult for you to understand, you may refer to me as Mr. Nero for now. He watches too much anime. Just like on the first day, our enigmatic teacher was casually taught, coding around a gargantuan valise. What is a valise? Ballas? I doubt anyone has my morning lark over here and feet in terms of getting up at god awful hours, though. Are you talking about his daughter? Yeah. Party with one's bed sheets. Isn't it a Herculean ordeal for everyone, Mr. Night Owl? Smiling wryly, Erwina rises to assist Mr. Nero with unpacking the Valis's contents. Valis's content, I don't know how to say that word. Though she generally relies on a retractable rod to navigate, I've noticed that sometimes she just doesn't seem to need it. I wonder how she does it. That sure is living up to his reputation as a bottomless black hole, isn't it? We watch on as the valise palpably shrinks as it as it is released from its bulging payload. Is this for the construction competition? What looked like a disassembled timble, table and the table and the components of a board game had been laid out before us. Ah, oh, about that. I have decided to postpone the bridge building contest until tomorrow. A man died bringing those bridge contents, bro. We will be having a lecture on the history of soccer training and tread, with these materials serving as a visual aid. No, it can't be true. It was all in vain. <laughs> Bleh. Letting out a strange cry, Lorona sinks to the ground with a soft flop. <laughs> the floor seemed to be quite the popular resting spot today. <laughs> Addy, I don't have to use your materials. Though she probably meant to say something along the lines of, it's good I don't have to impose it on you again. I decided to misinterpret it. I see. I knew this day would come. you finally grown sick and tired of my, me and my shiny materials. I understand, Aletta. I'm just not good enough for you anymore. Even then, I never imagined it would hurt this much to get discarded and forgotten. Wiping out my eyes, I sniffle and lower my gaze. It's not like I want to use you use my material want you to use my materials or anything. Addie, I'll use your materials, don't be sad. She looked like she was about to cry. There were actually tears in her eyes. You're so mean. You're so devoted, Noletta. Unable to contain myself, I giggle as I reach up to pinch her in the cheek. On the cheek. Moo She makes some weird noises, but doesn't try to resist as I play with her face. We will wait for several more students to arrive before commencing class. There's some more students. Our class had a regular, twelve regular had around twelve regular students in total. Since it had such a wide, such a wide age range, lessons could fluctuate from learning basic language one day to advanced science the next. Fortunately, the school is well equipped for dealing with its unique circumstances. I guess that's one of the perks of being well funded by a wealthy teacher. Those of us still standing kill some time poking at Laverna and Tress before the class begins. Finally begins. Now then, without further ado, let us begin the lecture on Socotrine history. Socotrine's history. The entire class was gathered around what could only be described as an oversized board game. 
Mr. Nero always had an unorthodox style of teaching. Conventional teaching tends to lean towards fixed methods and rote, rote memorization. But Mr. Nero was fond of something he called divergent thinking. As much as he tries to dress it up, I'm pretty sure he just gets bored easily. Who is this? Is this a map of soccer training? Indeed, it's far from accurate in terms of scale, but this board game has been laid out to stimulate Sakotrin's basic layout. Overall, Sakotrin can be divided broadly into five areas. The, oh gosh, Cairo Terran Terra Plains, the Urban Core, the Greater and Lower Padavelt Highlands, and the Muted Forest of the East. With a wave of his pointing stick, Mr. Nero redirects our attention to the blank boundary surrounding the hexes. One of Sakatrine's most distinguishing features is a dense wall of unimaginable abyss that surrounds and separates it from the outside unknown lands. Mr. Nero, Mr. Nero, what are the board game pieces supposed to be? You could think of the boxes as a population concentration indicators and cylinders as major industrial cylinders centers. The big piece in the center represents the heart of Socrates' infrastructure, the capital city of Socotra. Addy, where do we live? Uh, probably around here somewhere. As for the school, it's likely here, near here. Addy, maps are really amazing. What do you mean? They show the world, like, high in the sky, even though nobody's been in the sky before. Hmm. That's not true. I've been in the sky before, you know. Really? Wow. You shouldn't believe every, any, everything Eddie says, Noletta. This is the year 195, right? I was born in 194. That is correct. The court board states reflects the state of soccer trains 15 years ago when it was ruled by the old aristocracy. Wait, she was born in 194, and it's 195, so that was 50. What? Confused. I missed something. Dr. Trine was in the process of recovering from a period of famine and plague when the Master's Revolution occurred. The Master's Revolution was when people from unknown lands came, right? Yeah, Sakotrine had been long been aware of the existence of the unknown lands from artifacts that washed upon. up on. Evacets. Uh, word, Northern Banks. However, 195 marked the first time that actual people came from beyond the mist. In 195, a convoy of people describing themselves as refugees from a devastated land sailed down the river of Word and made contact with Sakotrine for the first time. Uh, I don't know. No, the old aristocracy welcomed the refugees at first. They eventually began to suspect the, that the convoy would attempt a coup. Where'd that river come from? Has it always been there? I don't think so. Mustering all of Sakotrin's might, the old aristocracy attempted to preemptively capture the refugees. However, they were soundly routed by the refugees convoy elite and combat unit, the lost children. In what came to be known as the Master's Revolution, the old aristocracy was overthrown, and the leader of the lost children and refugee convoy, the Ver Verluren Master, was installed as Sakatrine's sovereign ruler. Gosh. Is it true? Is it true the Verluren Master was a girl? The Verluren Master, Verluren Master, was indeed female, though it would be more accurate to call her a woman than a girl. I heard she was a genius swordmaster that took down a squad of Sakatrine's finest all by herself. There are rumors her unit annihilated entire armies back when she was in the Unknown Lands. Sounds like she was pretty good at bashing hands, but the, was the Florin Master a good ruler? In regards to that, let us jump around to the year 200. Mr. Nero takes the opportunity to make adjustments. To the, okay, we're not in one. Okay, I see what he's saying. I, I'm on to this. So she was, she's 16, 15 years ago from now, which is 210, would be 195, where we started. I'm on to this. I'm figuring it out. Mr. Nero takes the opportunity to 
Make adjustments to the board state before continuing. The five years that followed the master's revolutions are often considered a golden age in topic of the history. Golden again. Drawing from the advanced technology, expertise, and knowledge, the refugee convoy brought with them Sakatrine underwent a period of rapid innovation and reform. Mortality rates plummeted as contemporary medical science made its debut and birth rates skyrocketed as socioeconomic living conditions improved. However, that all came to a stop when the fire of collapse happened. A solemn science took over the room as Mr. Nero said about making major modifications to the board. I had been born shortly after the fire of collapse, so I had no memories of the event, but there was no doubt it had been a dark time in Socrates' history. In August of 200, for reasons that are not known, the shroud of mist that usually only surrounds Socrates' borders warped and covered the sky. Prismatic flames of unknown properties rained down from the mist, laying waste to the major swaths of Socrates' landscape. The area below Avic's southern banks suffered serious damage in particular, transforming into unrecognizable wasteland. Look at all those boxes that did. Look at all the boxes that disappeared. I wonder if you got burned by that rainbow fire. You had to get special treatment or else. The refugees of 195 had experienced a similar disaster in the unknown lands, so they were able to provide limited care, but there were too many victims to avoid a great loss of life. The fire of collapse did not mark the end of 200, though. In 195, the Valerian master had taken on a single Sakatrin attorney pupil, following her rise to power. Shortly after the fire of the collapse, that pupil changed the challenge of Valerian master to single combat, defeating her and claiming the title of Sakatrin's sovereign ruler as his own. He continues to rule Socrates to this day. We know him now as Lord Cecil Cotard. Oh gosh. Addy, Addy, that's your daddy, right? Yup, that's my pops, all right. He must have been crazy strong to defeat the Valoran Master. Hmm. I've always wondered what kind of pop relationship Papa had with his master. I just don't understand. For what reason did Papa feel compelled to usurp the Vlern Master? Unfortunately, there's not much insight I can offer on that matter. It is true, though, the Lord Catard has largely carried on his master's legacy in terms of policy. That just made things more confusing. Why take her over if they did the same thing? The pieces simply weren't lining up. I, I see why we're confused. Naturally, there were some that opposed Lord Catard's succession. I'm unconvinced that the inexperienced young Qatar could lead Sakotrin in his weakened state. The remnants of the old aristocracy took the opportunity to attempt an uprising. However, having also inherited leadership of the lost children, Lord Qatar crushed the uprising, scattering his opposition and consolidating his rule. It is now at last that we arrive at the current day of 210. Sako Train's reconstruction has been a slow and steady process, but it has been helped along by us several unexpected boons. So I mentioned before how the fire of collapse had mysterious properties. One particularly unusual effect is it's had been <laughs> it's had can be oh, I can't read it's had can be observed in what used to be southern wastelands. It is believed the ashes of the rainbow fire nourished the soil somehow as the land had recovered at an alarming rate, blooming into what is now as known as Evans Garden. I hate that word. It's scary how pretty that place is. Many townspeople avoid it because they're afraid of the unfamiliar types of flowers that blossom there. In any case, that concludes my lecture. Erwina will now take any questions that you may have. Passing the helm to Erwina, Mr. Nero retreats to his desk for a breather. Where's my breather, Mr. Nero? Huh? <laughs> I've been curious about this for a while, but don't refugees from the unknown lands have a name for the place they came from? That is a delicate topic. It is something of a taboo, taboo for the refugees of 195 to speak the name of their homeland. It is believed that for many of them, the name of the homeland is synonymous with atrocity. As such, they are. 
are often simply referred to as the Yoles, Oles. In that case, what about the Vlorian Master? What was her name before she assumed her title? Hmm. Vlorian Master is a big enigma, even today. Her real name is likely something only the member of the Lost Children knew. I see. Perhaps I should ask Papa or Mr. Damalor sometime. Who's Mr. Damalor? I think I saw him, but I don't remember. That's all the questions that I have for now. Turning the floor to other students, I wander over to the classroom windows with loss in thought. Dr. Trine's closed world dilemma. There has only been one recorded instance of anyone successfully traversing the boundary of mist that's Circle of Sagatrim's borders. Lauren Master, how did she lead the refugee convoy to Sagatrim? I couldn't help but feel it was a key piece of the puzzle. A puzzle that I've yearned to solve for as long as I can remember. Not enough. It's still not enough. I come back to myself. I find the class in the midst of a lunch break. <laughs> Wandering over to the usual group of Group's islands of desk, island of desk, I met with a pleasant surprise. <laughs> Nowina had pulled her desk over as well, bringing up, bringing our count up to a total of six. Nowina usually eats with her father at his assist, insistence, but it seemed our capricious teacher was taking a nap after gobbling up his lunch during the Q&A session. I take my seat and miss an already continuing conversation. Uh. Dasu lutu min wish ar turning wafu tisu mantu. I see, are you and Tris planning to do anything special for your 12th birthday? Newfound <laughs> wells, respect wells up inside of me. At Erwino's ability to comprehend Kalia's inco incoherent gambling. Kalia wasn't very fond of being fed by other people. As such, it was not uncommon for unintelligible garb garbling to leave her mouth as she went about stuffing her lunch with her face. About stuffing her face with her lunch, I guess. Even after the Second Great Food War made the casualties of that dark time rest in peace, we only ever gained... The right to clean her face after a meal. <laughs> Jesus. Hmm. I'm not as animated as Kalia. Watching El Rina eat was also an interesting experience. The manner in which she confirmed the position of her lunchbox, selected an article of food by its relative remaining proportion, and brought it to brought it levelly to her mouth was like clockwork. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll visit. Avgets Garden? Garden, I'm guessing. Jeez, Kalia. Don't I always tell you not to talk with your mouth full? Excuse me. Avgets Garden, though, huh? That's a wonderful spot to go for your birthday. Could it be somehow I'm not the abnormal one for not, for not. for having no clue what Kalia is saying? She alternates between chastisement and casual conversation. Verona picks out. A tasty morsel from Tristan's lunchbox. Since the five of us always share lunch together, we had a habit of taking from each other without much restraint. He can't defend himself. It's something we did without even thinking about it. So it wasn't hard to understand why our guest Erwina froze in shock when her spoon suddenly encountered Tristan's fork crouching around in her lunchbox. Eh? Ah, uh, huh? What aren't you doing, Trish? Don't just go picking through Erwina's lunchie without her permission. Permission. Oh! A brutal kick from Kalia to some undefined location on the desk caused Tris to spray a mouthful of his lunch all over an unfortunate Lorona. Yo! What, what is happening? <laughs> oh goodness. Don't have to forgive us, Erwina. We're all accustomed to sharing food with each other, so I guess Tris couldn't. Resist upon seeing how tasty your food looked. Ah, is that so? And we know pauses for a second as she considers my words. In that case, allow me to sample what you brought as well. A well-meaning smile rises to her lips as she pushes her lunchbox forward, signaling it's fine to take from her. 
At her invitation, the five of us who had always been curious about the palate of rich people are eagerly digging. Doesn't your dad run the whole country? You're the, the richest, I think. Wow, it's so delicious. I didn't know you were such a good chef, Erwina. Hey, Trina, stop stuffing yourself and give me some of that bourgeoisie goodie. Bourgeoisie. Naturally, Kalia didn't seem to have any issue accepting Aiden when it came to jacking the good part, best parts of the meal. Come on, Noletta. Open up. You can't just eat nothing but pasta all day long. I beg the differ. That is a lie. Moo. They are. What are you doing? You just spraying it all over your face? I pick, poke it in Noletta's mouth with a spoonful of air windows launch until she reluctantly parts her lips. Getting this child to eat something other than pasta could often be quite the struggle, because pasta's the best, she knows. After ensuring that Noletta would be safe from malnutrition for another day, I have to sample my own. Hmm. So this is what Erwin ate. Though it was certainly tasty, something seemed a bit off about it. Just to clarify, I didn't make any of this. It gets a bit chaotic when I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> As if recalling a silly memory, Erwina shakes her head. I bet she stabbed her dad while she's blind. Of course, it, father didn't make it either. With measured movements, Erwina probes through the lunchbox we had placed in front of her for easy access. How do you fancy the dishes of commoners, my lady? Freshingly proletarian, if I must, if I may say. Why, I simply must have more. <laughs> I really am quite fond of your lunches, though. How do I describe it? it? Feels like they are somehow made with warmth. I much prefer them to my own. Indeed, though the tasting was on point, somehow Erwina's lunch didn't feel very filling. It was strange. I'm glad you like it. Feel free to eat it with us again sometime. If you ever find your pop snoozing through lunch again, you're welcome to hang with the cool kids. More need wish. Are fine with it, I guess. Oh. Meanwhile, the Leary twins play to try to play it cool as they rapidly clean Arena's lunchbox and the thumbs up. You have my gratitude. Let us rendezvous in the future again sometime. The simple acting of sharing one simple act of sharing food once food with others makes it tastier after all. Can't wait until tomorrow, though me, Trist, spent all night study yesterday studying up on bridges. There's no way we'll lose. Perhaps it was meant to be a declaration of resolve or something of the sort. But with how her face was innocuously smeared with food, she looked more like a bib-toting toddler than a bold competitor. Look, you can even see the crumbs. Super well done. Unable to stomach the yucky sight, Triss immediately butts in and starts wiping Kalia's Kalia down with her a handkerchief. Jeez, Triss, can't you read the atmosphere? Now they're gone. Good job, Triss. Cuh, tee Atmosphere. I can read it. Forget about what I said before, you know, we're not the cool kids after all. We're pretty lame, actually. With an inquiring tilt of her head, Erwina listens on as the rest of us break out into laughter. She probably doesn't fully understand what was going on, but she smiles warmly at the good cheer we surround her with. Meals really are the best when shared in the company of others. Ah, hasn't lunch been over for a while now? Yes, but it appears that Mr. Noro has more pressing obligations to attend to. Our ever dedicated school teacher was currently in the process of revising today's lesson plans with his face drool. He fell asleep again? How many times must he be punished before he learns his lesson? With a grin that proves he's up to no good, Tris taps on Kalia's shoulder and gestures shadily at Mr. Nero's defenseless figure. Comprehending her his intentions with ease, Kalia snickers impishly. Hey, Arwina, would you turn a blind eye if we decide to play a prank on your dad? Gaffs. Suppose it can't be helped. Just don't let things get too out of hand. Gaffs everywhere. 
I got so are we not in. What shall we do now, though? The Lyris repertoire of pranks was quite expansive, but their usual antics wouldn't cut it. They wanted to do something Erwina could appreciate. Scanning the room for ideas, my eyes catch on Noletta as she plays around with Sussie, a younger classmate. The little one was teasing Noletta in a sec sac saccharine voice as she floated a balloon in and out of her reach. The scales have fallen from my eyes. We'll give him helium voice. With the grand gesture, I direct everyone's attention to the lightning scene before us. Oh, it's a kitty. In the highest form of approval, Triss spontaneously produces a white cat from somewhere and begins stroking it like an evil mastermind. <laughs> Mr. Evil! <laughs> Dr. Evil. <laughs> I'm really feeling it. Feline it. <laughs> oh, where'd all these pun these like references come out of? Firing off a clawful pun. Talia and Triss sets off to clear the balloon. Father, with helium voice, I cannot say the prospect is without appeal. You shouldn't do bad things to people who are sleeping. She's still got crumbs on her mouth. Remember last time when you tied my sleeves together while I was, when I was sleeping? That was so mean. T Rex Lerona is best Lerona. Likely due to her overloaded schedule, Lorna had a habit of switching off whenever she was rendered even remotely cozy. Naturally, that put her on the receiving end of countless pranks on her our part. But <sighs> it's so also really bad to fall asleep in class as teacher. Well, I don't know. I can't stop imagining Mr. Nerose squeaking like a cute little mouse. I can't do those. Well, I'll, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> our moral compass compromised by eternal conflict. There was nothing left to stand in the way of our schemes. Upon successfully persuade, persuading the owner, the Lyra twins return with no letter and balloon and tell. I, who will be the lucky soul carrying this out? This is good at being quiet. Oh gosh. <laughs> As if he'd been shot through the heart. Triss slumps to the ground, cat scampering from hand. This isn't even gaff territory anymore. This is just plain harassment. Triss is KIA. I'm not suitable for the job because reasons, and Noletta and Lorona are Noletta and Lorona. Therefore, I nominate Addie to bear the torch. I will seize the scepter of victory. Roused by Callia's flawless reasoning, I brandish the balloon with steeled reserve. What you need to do, do entails ensuring that father stays asleep. I can also be of service. He has a particular habit of sleeping deeply when his head is scratched a certain, in a certain way. With uncanny composure, Erwina discloses shocking intel to us. Ooh, he's like a kitty cat. It's decided then. The Operation Filium Bleed With a grand sweeping motion, I announce the commencement of our mission. I'll be counting on you to disable the dragon while I'll sneak into his lair to loot the gold, eh, Erwina. Today is the first time that we've involved Erwina in one of our missions. As such, no matter how fraught with peril this undertaking may be, failure cannot be allowed. Mission start! Ducking into the shadows of the first row of seat desk, I stand by as Erwina moves into position. With this wisdom of a weather sage, she <laughs> works with it. Works her magic. Chanting forbidden verses from a world beyond our own. Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> These verses, of course, had a brown resemblance to the mewing of a kitten, but I digress. The slumbering dragon's dangling glob of jewel expands in size as the great sorcery takes effect. When Erwina signals in my direction, general direction, I rapidly commence my infiltration. Posturing myself next to the throne, I look back to see that all of our comrades are watching with bated breath. Everyone is counting on me. I cannot fail! Reveling in the sensation of pressure, I carefully undo the knot, keeping the balloon shut before bringing it to my query's mouth. Doing this properly was a delicate balancing act. Too little and it would have no effect. Too much and our helmless prank could veer into dangerous territory. <laughs> it's now or never. 
Gauging the rhythm of its inhalations, I was waiting for the perfect window to release its balloon's opening. The dragon's eyelids twitch in discomfort as its lungs abruptly fill with helium. Fall back! Fall back! <laughs> Pulling away, I whispered as loud as I dare to our window. The two of us swiftly withdrawing. Withdraw. Take our, taking our seats just as Mr. Noro stirs and shakes his head in disorientation. Noticing the room is full of diligently waiting students, he opens his mouth to apologize. Oh dear, my apologies for keeping you all waiting. <laughs> Shoot, I can't do it. I don't have high-pitched voice. His squeaky voice is sure issues a series of sniggers from the kids with with less restraint. Mm, is there something on my face? Face with the clueless expression. Even the student with the greatest willpower were beginning to waver. What's going on? <laughs> At the classrooms full of the students on the verge of crack, cracking. Mr. Noah could only look on in confusion. Narita, what did you guys do? Whatever do you mean, Father? The students are pretty abused by that squeaky persona you started, slowly started acting out. The dam finally breaks Erwina's feign of ignorance. Unable to hold it back anymore, the room floods with bouts of laughter. Oh, so now that you mention it, my voice does seem unusually high-pitched. Who did this? <laughs> Mr. Noah's attempt to menace us and this harmless, mousy voice prompts several kids to fall out of their seat. The sight of everyone rolling around on the floor as they held their stomachs was quite the spectacle. Mr. Nero's eyes sweep over the classroom angrily for a while, for a while before eventually coming to rest on a certain desk. Did you bring a birthday balloon here for your birthday, Susie? Mr. Nero presses a palm to his face as he pieces it together. You mischievous little cretins! That's it! Outside! Right now! Ten laps around the school are for all of you! Even the suspensing water punch may only go out. More laughter out of us because of its delivery in a shrill and shrill and innocuous voice. When I look over at Erwina's seat, it pleases me to see that she is laughing her heart out alongside the rest of us. Even after carrying out our pins, the only thing anyone had to say about the whole degree was worth it. Stoic and detached, that was the kind of air Erwina always seemed to carry about her. I'm glad we were able to close the distance and see her smile wholeheartedly for once. Mission accomplished. After grumpily instructing us through the remainder of afternoon classes, Mr. Noro dismisses the class for the day. With Tris leaving the bulk of his materials at school, we had a considerably lighter load to bear as we forayed into town. I know I said tag along, but I can't really stick around for anything too le lengthy. Due to her talent and unique aesthetic, there was a generous demand for Lorena's hand woven products. Balancing school and work must have been surely taxing, but you never guess it looking at her ditzy smile. Yep, we're just stopping by the Morella Bakery for a bite. I reassure her as we make a final turn that places us squarely at our destination. A bakery? Pinching my hand on the door, I stop and exchange a look, exchange a glance with the Lyric twins. I wonder if they're thinking the same thing I am. With puckish grins on their face, they nod back at me. Newfound determination inside me as I push open the door to a familiar reception. Welcome to the Morella. The docile voice that greets us quickly transforms into squeaks of terror as three silhouettes dash forward with impeccable speed. Super spontaneous! Exhales. Ah! Tickle attack! <laughs> with the coordination of a seasoned wolf pack, Tris and I will brutally close in on our target's flanks as Callier circles behind for the takedown. <laughs> tickle, 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 tickle. Oh, glop nom. What is a glop nom? What are you doing back there? S stop. Ah, 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 ah. Can't take any. Ha ah, ah, anymore. Okay. After biting into the spoils of our successful hunt to our heart's contents, we finally relent to let Alouette capture catch a breath. 
Can't believe we were all on the same. I can't believe we were all on the same page. The litter twins exchange a painful looking forehead five to celebrate our clean kill. They pet butt each other? <laughs> they head buddy. Okay. Ow, not so hard, dummy. Not, not everyone is as blockhead as you are. Tris dances out of the way as Callie attempts to avenge her collective loss of brain cells with an angry knee. A joint maneuver from three directions at once to pincer the target. Double envelopment, a classic tra tactical stratagem, topped off with a rear blind set to seal the deal. All executed perfectly with the minimum of communication. Ooh, we were, really were breathing in a sink. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Though she doesn't really seem to get why an enthused no letter joins in on our cheering. You, you guys are scary. <laughs> After gaining control of her breathing, Alouette finally recovers from her trouncing and manages to get back on her feet. Wah, you really surprised me, Alouette. You really surprised Alouette. She talks in the third person. Alouette Bakia, a young woman with a st stilted style of speaking who worked here at the Morella Bakery. Though she was twice my age with change to spare, the impression she gave off could only be likened, could best be likened to a small woodland animal. Why is Alouette so irresistibly hug huggable? Calls for further investigation. Hadapion! In the name of science, I press my cheek up against hers and start not nuzzling her. Pachi Pachi! Alouette responds with a similar nonsense noise as she crosses my head with a serene expression. Hey, me too! Happy too, Pooba. <laughs> the litter twins push and shove as they struggle for the right to be spoiled by Alouette as well. Oh, wow. Alouette only has two hands. While Alouette had two younger siblings, she was used to pampering. Three at once must have been beyond what she was accustomed to. <laughs> you look like a sunbathing kitty. Kitten, Alouette. There are ways of reaching out and connecting with each others, even for those who are poor at expressing themselves through speech. It was through interacting with Alouette, through such a method. It was through interacting, okay. Touch that we've come to understand how much of a sweet heart she truly is. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hey, can't you see her imposing on Alouette? Seemingly interpreting Alouette's monopoly of our noggins as an infringement on her territory, Lorona starts peeling us away. Big sis Lorona can dole out wicked pats too, but though she does her best to <laughs> emulate Alouette, it is simply not meant to be. It doesn't feel half bad when you brush my hair, but you suck at giving head pats, Lorona. Oh, destroyed. With a solemn shake of his head, Triss extends a disapproving thumbs down. Eh? I don't get it. How hard could it be? Rona, my friend, the art of head pass is a path that can only be pursued when one has cleared her, their mind and heart. Isn't your anxiety and jealousy bleeding into, bleeding into your movements? Dark Lorona. Unable to be sated by Lorona's ham fist and malarkey, we abandon her in favor of LOS seamless strokes. No, where did I go wrong? When did I stray from the light? <laughs> There's no exaggeration to say Alouette was a master at this haptic form of communication. The way she gradually adjusted pressure from delicate to firm, migrated at perfect intervals from spot to spot, and mixed it up between her fingernails, finger pads, her nails, finger pads, and palms was, and palm was simply superb. But even more important than her peerless form and technique was the calming aura that pure and pure intent her movements projected. Whenever she touches you, it feels like your heart connects with hers for the briefest of moments. Noletta too. Alouette will pet, no, pet Noletta too. Noticing Noletta standing off by herself, Alouette tries reaching out to her. Dodge. However, Noletta doesn't budge an itch. Without a word, she just stares stares on silently at Alouette's outstretched arm. Unsure how to interpret Noletta's response, Alouette tiptoes into range and bashfully 
runs her fingertips along against Noletta's snow white tresses. Meet Mew, Noletta has such soft, poofy hair. What? That's no good, Noletta. You can't get head pats unless you make gibberish noise sounds too. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like a constipated cat. My nose is a constipated cat. God. You have to put your heart into it, Noletta. However, Noletta steps back from Alouette in a show of unmistakable rejection. What? Eh? Though she seems confused and distressed, Nolette, Alouette's attention is quickly diverted by the needy Lyric twins. What's the matter, Noletta? Sliding up to her, I whisper to her in a hushed voice. Alouette smells. <laughs> is that what it is? I'm pretty sure she knows how to bathe on her own, unlike a certain someone at first. My banter doesn't seem to lighten the mood, though. It smells like mist. Different, but also the same. Huh, that's so. I don't know what you mean by that, but she's a good-hearted person. Always has a smile on her face. Smiling all the time. It's the same same as never smiling. But Addie's right. Alouette's not fake. Fake. What meaning did that word hold to Noletta? Regardless, it didn't seem like she disliked or distrusted Alouette. I'm not sure I get it then. But Noletta merely shakes her head. I don't know. There are many questions I want to ask, but I decided to stop pressing Noletta for now. Sorry, we're not trying to force you to do anything you're uncomfortable with. I'll make it up to you later with those special Addy brand behind the ear rubs you like, okay? Hmm. Meanwhile, judging by their saliv salivating maws, it seemed the Lyric twins' minds had been already moved on to something else. That smell's got me hankering to sink my teeth into something already. It's so hard to remember. Ah, I can't do different voices, barely. It's so hard. <laughs> You're like a teething puppy, Alia. The aroma of baked sweets was certainly enticing enough to justify the obscene growls coming from Tristan's stomach. Though judging by his dreamy expression, he had already skipped ahead of us and ascended to confectionery heaven. Who is that? Looks like my valuable taste testers are finally here, Morella. With a thunderous interest, the person we've been waiting for emerges from deeper within the building. <laughs> Excuse me, gosh, my nose. The owner and principal baker of the establishment, Mr. Morella. He was a hardly built man whose laughter made buildings tremble in their foundation. It's something of a routine for us to taste test samples whenever he came up with a new recipe. That's why we were here today. Been tinkering with the nitty gritties of this batch for a while now. Come, come, you'll be the first to try it out. Big man smiles jovially as he brings out a tray of cake and gets portioning it out with a knife that seems comically small in his massive paws. While free treats were as anything to sneeze at, the most rewarding part for me was how Mr. Morello used our feedback to push the limits of his work. It's fun being the process of iteration and refinement behind creating a new dish. Strawberry and lychee cake it is the famous name of the game this time around. Chris, you dirty rat, don't go nibbling the corners off my piece while handling it, handing it to me. <laughs> Silly embraced Tris nosily as she smears crumbs all over her nose and cheeks. But Trish just shrugs haughtily in response, as if only rightfully taxing someone for his services. <laughs> what a dick. Nobody asked you for your help in the first place. Oh. With a ferocious lunge, Callie knees her supposed benefactor in the gut, causing him to spew his mouth full all over Lorona's nearby figure. God, he's always hitting Lorona. Why me again? Uh, all, uh, it's all over Lerona. Look what you did, dimwit. There are better ways to tell a girl you like them, Tris. <laughs> Mr. Morella guffaws at the lively scene as Alouette and I help pick up pieces of cake out of Lerona's hair before remorsefully cow-towing Tristan. 
Collateral damage! That was my Sakirene would have called it if she was here. <coughs> Sakirene was Mr. Morales' cutesy way of referring to his wife, which never ceases to amuse me, considering how powerful and influential she is. A Yule refugee, well versed in technology, Seichi Morello was one of the principal forces behind the develop development of Soccer Train's economic sector throughout its golden age and reconstruction. Her union with Mr. Morella had been, cel been a celebrated moment in history, marking the first time a native of Sakatrine and Yule refugee were joined in matrimony. I haven't seen Saki around lately. I hope Pop is not foisting too much of his responsibilities onto her. Ha ha ha! All I see of Sakari nowadays is her stalking face when she comes here for a tea break. You can bet. Fetch. About work. I'll have to call Papa for her when I get the chance. I'm sure she'd appreciate it. Ciao, Vadi. First Sakatronin costume. Ciao was a polite term used in conjunction with the shortened form of the name to address child children. Children. <laughs> Though it's considered endearing, family members and friends rarely use it. That's is somewhat formal. Hmm. Seems like we have quite a bit left over. I've decided. Oh, wait. Rhoda, take the rest home and make sure those little ones snarf it down. Something good. Yeah, are you sure I can really take this? They don't get to eat sweets too often, do they? It's a cardinal sin for kids not to have sweets. Any sweets. Giving Lorona no leeway to decline, Mr. Morello packages up the remaining cake and thrusts it into her hands. You're always looking after those orphans as if they were your own children. It's like you're their mom. Mommy Lorona. <laughs> no, it's nothing like that. If anything, I'm more like a f their fussy big sister. Make sure they eat up and get nice and plump. Thank you, Mr. Morella. <laughs> well, I guess a bite or two on the way back wouldn't hurt anyone. Nom nom. I'm st Struck by an ominous position, premonition as Lorona idly chips away at the cake and trusts it to her. Optimistic estimates project only a handful of crumbs surviving the journey home, perhaps a dab of frosting if, frosting if we're feeling generous. So what's the verdict of this trial, children? Mr. Mor Morella's eyes glitter in anticipation at what we have to say. Having carefully considered the dessert for a while now, I open my mouth to give it about my evaluation. Trash in the floor, honey flavor of lychee with the tartness of strawberry is a pretty neat idea. I'm not so sure about the execution though. The consistency of the cake is sort of heavy. I don't think that's the direction you want to take with this type of dish though. Instead of a pound cake like crumb, I would think a looser and fluffier texture will help showcase the lychee streaks better. I'm really fond of, fond of how you use the strawberries though. They're like Little acerbic checkpoints that, I, that reset your taste buds to keep the sweet parts fresh and free from staleness. Overall, I'd say it's tasty and has a lot of potential. Just, just rude. It's sweet. Mr. Morella nods in deep thought throughout a at the comprehensive input we provide him. Who knows? If pushed to the limit, perhaps this could. This one could even become a regular selection of this bakery. Oh, a regular selection of the bakery? To hear such words of praise from Shaw a day, Eddie. In his excitement, Mercer Morella slams his hand da hands down on the nearest counter with such force the resulting mini earthquake causes our feet to leave the ground. As always, your feedback helps immensely. You can do it, yeah! Practically bringing this down the ceiling as he skips away, Mr. Morella returns to the kitchen with renewed zeal. It's a nice feeling helping someone produce, pursue their passion. Addie's so smart, she always knows what to say at times like these. Uh -huh. Addie knows so many big words. Yeah, she does. That's because she, that's because she inhales books like some sort of brain slug. What cheek. <laughs> that reminds me. Pretending to have business elsewhere, I slip behind Callie and jump her. Ooh! I haven't filled my daily quota for brains yet. Yeah! Don't all on my head like that sound! Ah, oh, that feels so weird! 
not one to be left out. Triss joins in and begins grinding his teeth against her skull too, in a bit about a brain sucking of his own. Guy, they're eating me! <laughs> Please stop whatever you're doing and sending shivers down my spine. Trying to eat people is bad, Addy Triss. Anyways, we should get going now. Be going now. Anyways, we should be going now. It would probably be best wrap things up now for Lorona's sake. We'll resume our inquiry into your hug ability at a later date, Alouette. Quaby. Quaby, bye. Tap a doo! Tap a doo! Tap a freaking doo! Yes! Alouette gives us some final parting scratches before returning to man in the ca man to man the counter. That's my goodbye thing from now on. Dap a do. See you, Alouette. Play with us again sometime. <laughs> I'll return to the table where next time I drop by. Have a good day. nice day, Alouette. Bye bye. Waving goodbye to her, we depart from the Morello Bakery. After going our separate ways with Lorona and Loretta at the stream's bend, Noletta and I spot two figures in the distance as we near the Guru's cabin. It was Bressel and Mr. Damalor, Papa's proverbial right hand. As they draw near, I take note of the big pot in Bressel's hands. Oh, they're the brothers, siblings. Bressel, I'm back. What's in the pot? Oh, uh, it's empty. It's not. Huh? How did you know? <laughs> Who would lug an empty pot along like that, Bristle? Uh, me. <laughs> I can smell it. Did you make pasta? <laughs> yeah. But, but you can't eat it. Why not? Faced with no letters, inquiring gaze, Bristle shifts uncomfortably. Um, well, seeing that he struggle, Mr. Damelow chooses then to speak up. Your brother is still learning, Charlotte. Letta. He made several errors with this batch, and therefore does not wish to share it. I believe he wants to make sure it's perfect for b before sharing it with you. Oh. You'll make something as good miss as Mr. Damelow? Yeah, it might take a while, but I'm- but look forward to it. Okay, I'll wait for you. These two have such a cute relationship, it makes me jealous. You offered to take Bristle as an apprentice in either sword or the culinary arts, right, Mr. Damalore? I think it's nice he chose to go with cooking. I am of the same opinion. With how transparent Bristle was, Anyone could tell he chose the path of cooking, so he could cook lots of pasta to make his sister happy. So I hope he branches out eventually. No, Letta really needs to start eating her veggies. <laughs> By the way, Mr. Damler, why do owls even use swords in the first place? One would imagine much deadlier weapons would be produced with the old technology. Quite observant of you, Shaw Ade. As the oldest member of the Lost Children, I remember a time when our homeland used firearms known as guns to fight. They enabled you to kill someone with the simple pull of a finger, making even children deadly combatants in war. When the calamities overwrote the laws of our world, many of the projectile weapons we depended on lost their effectiveness. However, that did not end our wars. Our homeland simply took to up the sword to continue its bloodshed. Do not be mistaken, though. The old arm arms and armor are produced from the state-of-the-art technology, our weapon theory has been forged in flames of countless wars. For example, the Lost Children's signature weapon, the Reaper Blade, a peculiar double-edged sword that enabled the user to deliver a crippling low-line cuts in, from unconventional angles. Oh yeah, this came up in class, but do you know what the Bellerin Master's name was? Master's name? Hmm. Mr. D Damler makes a difficult expression in my question. She didn't have one. Huh? 
I was like most people in the war, someone who was dropped onto the battlefield, but Master was different. She was born on the battlefield. The closest thing she had to her name was a call sign. I see. Names don't seem like the hottest trends in unknown lands. A name is something that should be treasured. I have came up, come to understand that after serving under one who has never known that simple blessing. Something we take for granted. Something we should take for granted. Yeah, it could not... Yeah, it could not be said everyone possessed that small, ordinary treasure. In any case, the young master will not be returning tonight, Shalade. So, allow me to prepare your dinner for today. Oh, leaving me all by my lonesome again. What an awful papa. On the contrary, it is because the young master is thinking of you that he sent me here. I do have some business to attend to beforehand, so I shall be taking my leave for now. With that, Mr. Damalor melts into the shadows of the sunset, leaving the three of us behind. Um, you can go ahead and play with Addy, Noletta. I'm tired, so I'm going to go in and rest. Why? You'll get lonely. What? No, no, I won't. Y you will. N no. You will. <laughs> Why don't you play with us too, Brussel? Then no one will be lonely. But I need to find out why I messed this batch up. Mr. Damalor said I had to figure it out. That's so. Let's do that together then. I'm pretty good at critiquing food, you know. Ooh, okay. Addie's criticizing is scary though. Don't worry, if you cry for over 10 minutes, I'll stop. Why only if it's for ten, more than 10 minutes? <laughs> Having persuaded Bressel, the three of us set off. Three of us set off towards my house. It must be nice having a big brother that looks after you, Noletta. Russell looks after me? Noletta makes a mystified expression as if I had just claimed pigs were flying through the sky. No, I'm the one that looks after Bressel. If I don't make him eat, he goes hungry without saying anything. If I don't hold his hand, he can't fall asleep. He gets lonely and cries easy. He has trouble opening jars. Jesus. <laughs> No, no letter. What are you telling Addy? <laughs> Don't worry. I already know most of those things. Ooh. That's not all. No letter always. No letter always chases away anyone that bullies Brussel. Isn't that right, Big Brother Brussel? I tease Brussel in a sing songy voice, causing him to pucker up like a sad puppy. <laughs> Are you bullying Bressel right now, Addy? Yup, so better you better chase me away. <laughs> okay. Don't chase her! In a comical turn of events, Bressel starts chasing after Noletta, who was chasing after me. Hey. Wah, too slow. It was true that Noletta always seems to be taking care of her awkward older brother, but having someone to look after like that was a treasure in its own right. Being an only child, it made me a bit envious. Why are you like this, Noletta? It was a peaceful scene, being pursued by a pair of silly siblings under beneath the evening sun. This ordinary daily life full of tiny miracles. I hope that tomorrow will be just as gold as what allows me to accept today must end. Uh oh. We're going back in the- what the- it's a book. Every book always ends the exact same way. Bank for cop page. What does that mean? The ending page? From zero back to zero, huh? The blank page is found at the end of a story never filled. I guess it means vacant because it's like empty. Never failed to fill me with a gaping sense of emptiness. The end of an adventure, the freezing of time in the world encapsulated by the book. It made me feel lonely, thinking the author's pen had stopped, leaving the characters trapped in limbo of unwritten interaction. Characters in a book cannot move without a character's writer's conception and a reader's acknowledgement. Forever bound by the unseen script of God they can never know of, they exist as nothing unless imbued by with the will of that God. <sighs> I should really shouldn't read another. Though it's quite 
getting quite late into the night. I don't want to stop reading. The feeling of emptiness that a book end instills can be filled by starting a new book, after all. Just like a thin finger turning back a page, or perhaps like taking a second volume into one's hand. So long as the sorrowful reader continues to reject the reality, the story will go on forever. A nursery rhyme from the new world where the lonely me fell in love with the book. Characters she'd been with throughout their entire lives, dear companions she had come to form a bond with. Yet at the book's end, they could no longer stay by her side. So the lonely me asked of the sorrowful me for another dream, another meeting, and another parting. Cool poison, a sweet necessary pain. That is what stories are. I rub my tired eyes as I gaze out the window into the quiet night. The illuminating warmth of the sun had faded long ago, draping the land in an uncertain darkness. Everything is cozier in candlelight. When the real world goes fuzzy, the floor around the page grows sharper. Nothing eases poison down the throat better than emptiness. <laughs> An empty, unchanging world. Why are you so depressing? God, stop thinking so hard about shit. So much like that golden dream, it's always filled me with an uneasy restlessness being alone like this. Now it was many hours later, and I was still up in Mother's room. That's right, whenever I read the books Mother left behind, a warm feeling always wells up inside of me. A feeling I'm always reluctant to let go of. No, this wasn't actually her room. When she died, she, we moved away from the house where she once lived. The room merely held all the books that once belonged to her. Pablo had brought them along, not wanting to leave them behind to gather dust in the old house. Golden Dreams archives dwarfed it, but lacked the soul that laid in Mother's private collection. Pages that carried a distinct scent, bindings worn by that passage of time, with the creakle sheaths there laid a certain feeling. A wistful kind of despair, one that denied a reality that was far too cruel. Hey, Mother. The lonely me. That person was you, wasn't it? I've always wanted to ask about her. Whenever I do, it hurts Papa. With a pained expression, he would go silent and look down as if gazing at words, too shattered to pick off the ground. All I knew was that the day we commemorated her death was the same as my birthday. My 10th birthday coincides with the 10th anniversary of her death, so you never actually met her. That's really sad, too. In other words, she died the same day I was born. Mother's story ended where mine began. A face I did not know, but one I've always longed to touch and behold. Maybe your mom was the master of Valorian or whatever. Sometimes I want to imagine her face coming alive, laughing with, laughing when reading something funny or crying or when reading something that's sad, but I can't. Because to me, she doesn't have a face. Even Papa is afraid her face is fading from his mind's eye. For me, though, Mother did not exist as a person. Having never known her of her, she was nothing more than a nebulous concept of vague warmth that I couldn't give form to, no matter how much I wished to. The only form of connection I had with her were these books. Why? Why won't you tell me anything, Papa? I heave a high beside. Huh. It's about time I call it a day. I'll sleep here tonight as well. Sometimes I wonder if the blankets and pillows have here seem more than the ones in my actual bedroom. Seem more used than the ones in my actual bedroom. Instead of machine the nearby candles, I retreat under my covers and stare up at the dark ceiling. I guess Kelly was right about me being a book in hell and brain slug. With a little chuckle, I boop an imaginary Kelly on the nose before shutting my eyes to the world. And we're back in the school. A certain restlessness. God, my nose always pervades the air. <laughs> The day before the weekend, the day of school before the weekend. But the day was even livelier than you. Oh, crack, smash! What is going on? Yay! Bridge breaking. My bridge finally broke. You're not supposed to want to break your bridge, dummy. <laughs> Looks like we have our last two contestants, Adelise and Lear Twins. <laughs> That's a pretty good EC design, Addy. Spencer's bridges are tricky to build. Guess you've done your fair share of research, too. Indeed. 
Through the tension cables that suspension benches were known utilized were known for, their highly efficient weight to load bearing ratio, working with them had been a great source of headache throughout the day. Looks like you went with a truss bridge, a pretty safe choice for the risk taking their twins. It's all about the fundamentals when it comes to this kind of thing. <laughs> it's already clear at this point who the winners will be, wonder what kind of prize we'll be receiving. You sure you want to declare your victory so prematurely? I'll make your upcoming loss sting much more, you know. Oh wow. Just as the two of us square off and start laying down the trash talk, Trist suddenly belches loudly, completely ruining the mood. He looks pleased with himself. Oh, Trist. Uh, could you be any more cool, uncool? In the final state, in the final stage, we will simultaneously add weights to each bridge at regular intervals until we get to the last bridge standing. Now are the finalists ready? The class cheers as the promised time arrives at last. Arrives at last. Let's do this. Me and Tris are taking this one home today. This one, the one's taking home. Let's win today. I can't read. The only thing you'll be taking home is the remnants of your trust. Who will be the last ones to claim today's special tries? Will it be the plucky Lair twins or the cunning Adelise? The time has come to determine the winner of today's bridgey construction contest. That's it. The final showdown. The three of us watch it. Watch over our bridge intently as intimidating new masses are added to their already belging payloads. Each time they successfully withstand the mounting pressure on... <laughs> Our breaths of relief resound, though the tenth classroom, which had fallen unnervingly silent compared to its previous commotion. Methodically, slowly, our bridges are placed under such duress their flames begin to frames begin to reform from the strain. Time seems to crawl to a uh, time seems to slow to a crawl as foreboding a feeling as a foreboding feeling that the upcoming wait would bring the moment of truth grips me. Then, just as the weight in question is added, huh? Huh? The sound of splintering woods echoes to the air as someone bridges finally give in. Shock silence swelled up within the room at that sighting instant. A single voice spoke. A conclusion has been reached. The winner is the Lyra Twins. The room explodes in cheers and cries at the declaration of the victor. No, it can't be true. I gazed down in disbelief upon the remnants of my sweet toil. Creation and destruction, such transient beauty. I knew it could have come to this, and yet it still wounds me. With the swagger of an undisputed champion, Kalia utters the ultimate words of victory. Oh, good game. Easy, scrub, get good, noob. <laughs> As this is... As the decisive winners, would you care to elaborate on your success to the class, Kalia? What do you think was the most important thing to keep in mind in regards to design decisions? If there's one thing that would have been the center of the focus, it was the rule that all bridges must be under a certain weight limit. Though your bridge really did have a sturdy weight to load bearing ratio, Addy, it didn't approach with the weight limit that was given for the contest. I know it's that as well, but it was difficult for me to do anything about it. That's because suspension bridges are tough to reinforce after they're first built. It's hard for you to do much with the wiggle room you end up with if you don't if it doesn't reach the cap right away. I see. Then can you tell us why you chose the design you did? You two chose the design you did. Tristan and I decided that a trust bridge was the best design for taking advantage of the limit. Trust bridges are already ma are made out, almost out of almost all. Uh, ah, I can't read. Trust bridges are made almost out. Of, trust bridges are made almost all out of triangles, which are the simplest and strongest shape. <laughs> okay. Oh. Triangles are strong because they're hard to deform. Like if you push on the corner of a square, you can easily turn it into another shape, like a rhombus, right? But if you put a small diagonal bar inside the square and basically turn it into two triangles, it becomes really hard to change its shape. This is some big brain stuff. Also, since triangles are the simplest shape with only three sides, it's easy to reinforce a truss bridge. The triangle is indeed a central building block in construction. It appears you are learning much from your father, Atun Lirit. Atun Lirit. 
Tris did a good job trimming off weight, weight off parts that we didn't need. We used a lot of smart tricks like using the smallest amount of glue possible to connect the bridge parts. This was done by using a dab of glue and binder clips to make sure it would attach strongly. At the end of the day, this project was all about milking as much as you could out of the bridge's weight limit. Wow, you two make such a cool team when you work together. It's definitely why you won. As much as it pains me to concede this feat, I won't deny the groundwork is impressively well thought out. Guess my bridge couldn't handle the suspense. Well played, you two. Ha ha ha! It's a pun because we made a suspense bridge. <laughs> I'm pretty sure our bridge could hold even more if we wanted it to. Perhaps waiting to test her point, Triss reaches out gently, <laughs> wraps their bridge with his knuckle, causing it to collapse. <laughs> Ah, it broke. Mm. Not even close, baby. Edging over to block the scene with her body, Callie gives Triss a stomp to the foot for good measure as she as he stands dumbfounded with his hands still suspended in midair. Somehow I feel tired all of a sudden. While losing on the cusp of glory makes me somewhat salty, I have to admit their methods were on point. Just goes to show the value of being taught by someone with experience over simply reading about it in the book. As promised, I will now award you two your prize. With the light movements characteristic to handling something delicate, Mr. Nora unveils something from his valves and lowers it into Tristan's hands. Murmurs of awe could be heard around the class, hurriedly crowded around the object in question. This is an ornamental hair clip from the This is an ornamental hair clip created by from the blazing orange feathers of the Phoenix Oriole, a species thought to have gone extinct since the fire of the collapse. It's like it's on fire, burning, burning up. Mr. Nero always gives the gifts the coolest things. While while the class was clearly enraptured, one person all alone seemed detached from the clamor. The person whose reaction you'd expect to be yelling at Trist to let her see it already. But instead, she gazes on wordlessly from a distance. However, Trist doesn't fail to notice this. Taking the feather envelopment in his hands, he slides, sidles up to his sister with an indiscreet motion, clips it onto her head. What are you doing all of a sudden? But Trist just smiles dumbly in response. Do you remember Triss? The bedtime story she once told us? And the story of the rainbow crow? Without a hint of hesitation, Triss nods. You know, right? Even though it wasn't the truth, she wanted to let us know of a happy ending. That's why we have to. With all we've got, with all we've got, we have to. A girl who couldn't take hold of anything, even as it lay right before her. And a boy who couldn't make his unspoken heart heard. It was a scene that captured the essence of the relationship between the Lyric twins. Just as Callie acted as Triss's voice when he could not voice himself, Triss acted as Callie's hands when she could not reach out. There's a nuanced bond, one would never guess, but with how they were always messing around with each other. We did it, Triss. Don't get too smug, though. This is only... This is just the beginning. Smiling faintly, they lightly bump heads from the forehead by That's so hard, dummy. <laughs> uh, somehow it's really heartwarming. Me too! Don't do it! Ah, oh, blur! <laughs> ding, ding, ding. It appears that in their enthusiasm to join their forehead by session the Lorona missile and knocked out the Lear into a town commission. Why don't you ever get big so Sorona? Forehead fives! It's not fair! Blub blub blub. I think the answer to the question is self evident. Sibling love is not something to be underestimated. Alia Trist, they make me proud. They've come such a long way from the dark place they were in two years ago. Alright, class. Though it's an eventful day, it's not over yet. We have quite a bit to clean up. Everything has to be squeaky clean if you want to get to the real fun. An air of unrest pervaded the room as 
students ran about tidying up things up to the best of their ability. But the reason was far from being because everyone was anticipating being let out for the day. Rather, everyone was looking forward to staying as long as they possibly could. Now the moment you've all been waiting for. With Erwina as side, Mr. Nero gestures over their iconic phallus. GAMES DAY! Everyone shouts in chorus as Erwina flips over the phallus. A flurry of balloon floods out all at once, blanketing the floor of the school. Not even the ceiling was spared of the helium-filled ones flew into the air. As uh, that thing was really living up to its reputation as a whole to another dimension. For today's game, we will be playing a special version of Capture the Flag, inspired by an event yesterday that none shall speak of. <laughs> the class will be divided into two teams of players. Each player will have a balloon tied around their waist and that signifies their life. That balloon is popped, such as by an opposing team member. You will be counted as being slain. After your balloon is popped, you cannot rejoin the game until you return to your team's base and acquire another balloon from your team's allotted stockpile. The objective is to force the enemy team to deplete their balloon supply while protecting your own supply. I said supply. Supply. God. <laughs> Additionally, each team base will have a special flag that can be captured by the enemy team. A successful capture means that the opposing team must pop 10 of the balloons in their stockpile. Is there anything else you'd like to know? What do we get for winning? More wrapped at the attention than any lecture he could hope, ever hope to give, this class screams out in unison. First off, a team will be counted as losing if all the balloons worn and stored on this side are popped. A losing team must accept punishment of inhaling helium until their voice becomes squeaky. Once that is done, the other team gets the exclusive right of dictating what must be voiced during the duration. Everyone quivered at the possibility of being forced to endure, forced to endure such humiliation. Yet at the same time, there was no denying the tantalizing prospect of reveling in the shame of the defeated. I will now announce the teams. After Mr. Nero finishes assigning the teams, I quickly survey what we have to work with. On my team, the blue team, were Tristan, Lerona, and Noletta, along with Lemmy and Annabelle. Wait, they separated the twins? I don't think that's a good idea. I vote to make Addy our team captain. The moment we would assemble and learn it, immediately makes that suggestion. Looking around, I see everyone nodding in approval. Leave it to me. I nod back, emboldened by everyone's unwavering confidence in me. Foremost in my thoughts were how to deal with the team's aces, red team's aces, Kalia and Erwina. One might think our team would be <laughs> at an advantage against the armless Kalia and unseeing under Erwina, but they would be far from correct. Kalia was an unmatched speed demon that can run circles around us without getting caught, and her mobility allowing her to switch between attacking and defending quickly. The only thing that gated her was that she needed team support to secure objectives. As for Erwina, I was convinced she was a bat or something because when she got heated up, she could move. She moved more like someone who could see another, an additional dimension rather than nothing. Erwina's physical capabilities were also out of this world, with them, there being little doubt she could take anyone in a straight one-on-one. -on -one. That being said, she was the other extreme for Kalia, being uh, unable to maneuver around the battlefield too well with her vision impairment. Though her anti-personnel was peerless, she lacked offensive presence in regards to wind conditions, like raiding stockpiles and capturing flags, meaning we'd likely find her on base defense. As for our team, we had a Triss, a slower but more prudent departure for Kalia, whose aggressive nature and quickness made him ideal for blitzing. Noletta, on the other hand, was cool-headed and resilient, with her sluggish speed making her more suited to holding down the fort. Lastly, Lerona didn't have any noteworthy strengths on her own, but her aptitude for, team, for working on a team was difficult to overstate. She always seemed to have a good nose for covering teammates what they got when they got themselves in a pinch, which made her synergize well with risk takers like Triss or Kalia. After breaking down our strengths and weaknesses, I assembled strike team of the three consisting of Lerona, Triss, and me, and Noletta, Annabelle, and Lumi making up the de base defense team. Everybody knows their role, right? Let's get out there and do some damage. Breaking from our huddle with a battle cry, 
<laughs> Look over at the red team to see how they are faring. Just to confirm, the balloons are pitching, positioned around everyone's lower back, correct? That's right. Just give it a nice kick and it'll should go pop. A toothy grin could be seen on Callio's face as she warmed up by kicking the air around what would be someone's eye level. Well, that's something to look forward to. <laughs> Who's ready to win? Turning my, back to my team, I stretched my hand out into the air to rally them. We are! Morale was already skyrocketing through the roof. Unable to contain our energy any longer, we rush outside the school building to set up base for the upcoming clash. As we do, I begin to give a more detailed directives regarding our lineup. Tactical man command of our base defense will fall on Noletta. Noletta, the stock flag and stockpile are separate locations, so make sure at least one person is guarding each at all times. Assign the quickest person to pressure relief. Should one location get focused down. Okay. The measure was necessary since I'd be concentrating my attention on directing the strike team. Tell us what to do, Noletta. We won't let them through. Chris, I want you to be the strike team's vanguard. Don't make any attempts on the objectives unless I order it. Just concentrate on picking off someone off in their base. Once you poke a hole in the enemy's defense, I'll direct how we push in. Chris shivers <laughs> with excitement as he takes a deep breath and nods. The lyrics thrived under pressure, the high pressure of spearheading assaults, jumping on opponents the moment they showed a window of vulnerability. It was very much of a risk reward form of approach, which is why the support savvy Lorona was invaluable for safely securing any leverage we generated. Lorona, be sure to stick close to Triss so you can follow up on his takedowns and back him up if he gets blindsided. Okay. Be prepared to commit to a full-on assault at my signal. After going over defensive contingencies, should our base be overrun, I turned to survey the battlefield. Our strike team was highly concentrated one, rather than spreading out our attackers, and aimed to overwhelm and spill into one section of the enemy's base. As such, it was good for the surgical strikes and maintaining offensive momentum should even a single defensive rampart fall. The main reason I selected this team composition was because it was well equipped at avoiding Erwina and attacking the areas she wasn't defended. Defending. The comp did have a share of weaknesses though. It was easier for the enemy to surround us and had ambient weak battleground presence for deterring attacks or relieving pressure on our own base. A lot depended on Nalea's defense to hold the line for the strategy to be successful. Upon completing our preparations, we line up to face the red team's camp. Seeing that both sides are ready for action, Mr. Nero lifts his hands to announce the commencement of the game. One last thing before we begin. There is a trump card hidden somewhere on the battlefield. Before his hand descends through a devilish smile, plays a devilish smile plays over Mr. Nero's face as he inserts a sudden addendum to the game. Whoever discovers this trump card will have be granted a powerful advantage. You find your team on the verge of defeat. Search for the trump card to turn the tide of battle. That's our teacher for you, adding a wild card right as the game is about to begin to generate the maximum amount of hype. Your only hint is as follows. Look through the sky to find the pure purpose of the school. The tension saturated battlefield stirred at Mr. Nero's cryptic words. Now begin! Cutting that tension with the grand arc of his hand, Mr. Nero releases us at last. There's no time to dawdle on Mr. Nero's riddle. Almost immediately, Triss explodes into action with Lorona and me falling close behind. Crossing up the opponents that had advanced to attack, he weaves an oblique pattern through the enemy formation and crashes aggressively against their defenses. <laughs> Look at that serious face! Pop! Tripping up one of the defenders that moves forward to meet him, Trist opens up an opportunity for Lorna to follow up and pop the balloon. One defender left manning the red team's flag while the stockpile appeared to be unguarded and unwise choice. Though the name of the game is Capture the Flag, in this version a flag is only worth 10 balloons. Given enough time, the personnel you in personnel you can pop all of the team's balloon if you attack their stockpile, making it far 
much more valuable objective. Charge the stockpile! I ordered an audacious charge to take advantage of our lightning fast breach of the enemy's defenses. Diving deep into the heart of the enemy, we eliminate the last defender by drawing him into a pincer as he hastily rushes to intercept us from his post on the flag. Pop as many stockpile balloons as you can! Just as Triss reaches for an enemy balloon, though something strange happens. A rod extends from the cluster of balloons, slightly tapping Triss on the side. Oh, she's inside of it. She's in the stockpile. Like a sprung trap, a hand erupts from within, scattering the balloons in its wake. Catching and redirecting his momentum with practice ease, it drives Triss straight to the ground. It was Erwina! But just as she lashes out to finish him. Yeah! Lorona manages to leave him, heave him out of the way before collapsing to the ground herself. Crap, I had predicted Erwina would be on base defense. Why hadn't I... Why hadn't I considered the possibility of an ambush? Our offensive momentum has stalled completely, but in the face of a, our veritable opponent. You shall not pass. With the declaration of paying absolute conviction, Erwina pounds her cane to the ground. A light touch with that thing was all she needed to confirm your position and take you down. That Triss had survived was a miracle. Lorona wasn't lucky though, I'm guessing. No matter how I looked at it, we were thoroughly outmatched. Taking Erwina head on wasn't an option, and it wouldn't be long before the other defenders acquired new balloons and reinforced her, turning this into a losing battle. Retreat and go for the flag! Recalling we had eliminated its guard, I shot, shouted our team to redirect our efforts. Erwina is fir the first to react to my order. Dashing forward to catch us, her rod chases after Tristan and Lorona as they desperately try to scam scramble around her. They can't get away without help! Eyeing Erwina's movements, I circle around to get an angle on her back before lunging forward with a deliberately loud stomp. What? Nani? Reacting with lightning speed, Erwina swivels around and checks my motion with her rod, hovering more in mere inches from my chest. There's no exaggeration to say the radius around Erwina's person was a no man's land. If I had misjudged the distance and stopped any shorter, I'd be a goner right now. Realizing Triss and Lorona had used the distraction to peel off, I did promptly disengage as well and make a run for the flag. Ruby one, now! Interrupting Erwina's cry as a panic signal, I hastily grabbed the red flag and start to fall back with the rest of the strike team. Watch out, Eddie! Oh, we can even clear the enemy camp, though. A blur of movement fits in the corner of my eye. Thanks to Lorona's warning, I managed to duck just as a foot sails to the air and threatens to lop off my head. It was Callier, with her customary lack of chill. Utilizing her trademark speed, she had rotated back to defend in the blink of an eye. Oh, he tackled her. <laughs> as Kelly advances to follow up on her with Triss jumps in to intervene, tumbling to the ground with her in the process. At that moment, two red team members swoop in from behind to try and finish Triss off as he grapples with Talia on the ground. Lorona cuts it to shield him, but it is clear she's outnumbered. The red team's base defense had recovered and was attacking from behind. With the red offense cutting us off from the front and the red's defense pressuring us from behind, we were completely surrounded. Go, Addy, we'll hold them off. Grasping that we can't avoid taking casualties, I abandon my teammates and take off with due speed. I keep my eyes peeled as I approach our flag holding ground where the capture can be solidified if I manage to make it. That's when I perceive two people closing in on me from each both flanks at once. It was the rest of the team's red team's assault squad. Judging that they'd catch me before I made it back home, I just juked to the side at the last moment causing them to skid off course. They quickly regained balance before resuming their pursuit of me though. There's no way I can outrun them while encumbered by this flag and I'm still too far away. At this rate, my comrades' sacrifices will be in vain! Just as the duo leaps at me, though, a strong gust blows past my face. A figure had placed itself between me and the crouching enemies, utterly laying one out and stopping the other dead in its tracks. It was Noletta! The opponent in her grasp crumbles spectacularly as she overpowers him, allowing the, other, the two under her command to neutralize the rest of the enemy's balloons. It looked like she made her decision to abandon base defense to coverage on, converge on and secure the flag. Lerona and Triss are down. 
The red team is mobilizing to launch a counterattack. We'll hold them back. Hurry, Addy. Nodding quietly, Edna led us back. I'll waste no time in leaving my companions behind. Placing my trust and turn in them as they stand their ground. Upon reaching, arriving at our flag holding area, I plant the enemy flag into the ground and shout out, Red flag capture complete! The blue team has successfully captured the enemy red team's flag. As stipulated in the route, I will now proceed to pop 10 of the balloons in the red team's stockpile. As I turn back to confirm the situation, I feel my jaw dropping in disbelief at what I see. Talia was hurling down the battlefield at breaking neck speed, which wasn't unusual in itself. It was the fact that some, a certain someone was telling her behind her that defied all expectations. There we know. Ruby 1 commencing delivery of the package. Aqua, at 2 o'clock. Get him, Erwina. Oh gosh. Planting her feet, Kalia uses her body as a fulcrum to pivot and swing her package out ahead of her. With one hand gripping Kalia's dangling sleeve, Erwina reaches out with her rod to confirm Lemmy's location before sweeping his legs out from underneath him with blinding swiftness. And after pulling Kalia in to land the killing stop, Erwina lets Kalia propel her to the next target in a deadly dance that rapidly mows down the rest of Noletta's base defense team. It's like something lifted straight out of a nightmare. It sounds like it. The freedom that Kalia's slack sleeve offered in conjunction with her blazing speed had allowed for a scenario I'd never imagined. The rapid deployment of Erwina on the front line. The capturing, capturing the flag and resetting to neutral would have granted us a war of attrition where the red team would be pressured to commit the disadvantage offensive disadvantage offensives but we had expended too many resources in pursuit of that objective they were employing their most powerful asset at the optimal time while we were still weak from our blitz gambit the galia erwina delivery combo was a perfect counter offensive for punishing our overextension looking over our stacked po stockpile i catch sight of tris and lorona attempting to tie on their balloons but the two red defense members from before had followed them and were popping balloons left and right as they attempted to revive. We're getting camped! <laughs> That's it's messed up. With a yelp, Lorona drives out of the way as Kalia and Erwina arrive to capitalize on the red team stalling. As the only one alive, I could only watch powerlessly as the red team ignored our flag and went straight for our for the throat. When Oleta and her team Returned to try and revive, Rona and Tress managed to slip out with balloons and rejoin me. But even with them, we don't have the forces to retake our lost ground. Contending with the unstoppable Kalia Irwina Juggernaut was daunting enough, but we also had a numbers disadvantage. What should we do? And the hope seemed to be fading from Lorona's eyes. Giving up now wasn't an option. We're abandoning base. Wipe out their stockpile. If we can't defend, then we'll just have to strike back. Red had committed all their resources to an all-out offensive, so their stockpile was wide open. Responding to a crippling counterattack with a counterattack of our own was a desperate measure, but it was the only option we had right now. Nodding at me grimly, the blue team strike blue strike team takes off to clean up the rest of the stockpiles and reds rest of the balloons in the red stockpile. On the way, we encounter the two red offense members that Noletta had previously subdued, but they wisely keep their distance, opting instead of to regroup with the rest of their team. When we arrive, we manage to finish the job quickly, with Tin having already been eliminated from our fly capture. But even the situation, then the situation looked weak. Bleak. With <laughs> With both stockpiles exhausted and all objectives rendered obsolete, the red team could turn their fangs on us. The over odds were overwhelming. 3 versus 6 with the red team being at full power. Taking full advantage of their numbers, the red team spread out in a fan formation, seizing comprehensive control of the battlefield as the game enters the final phase. Slowly but surely, they press our diminutive group into a corner with safe and systematic skirmishes, giving us no chance to fight back. Though we were managing to ward off the combined attacks of Kalia's offense team and Erwina's defense team, we were growing tired under the continued harass. We had no relief options compared to the red team we could, who could alternate fresh bodies to keep up the siege. It's useless, Addy. 
Your team's morale has fallen too low. You cannot win! Talia taunts us as we gradually run out of space to back up in. But loot surrender was not an option. Even if we have to crawl, we'll ne we will never give up. There's still a way, we just need to find the trump card. I tried to rally my comrades behind that final shot of hope, but exhaustion was beginning to creep into my even my voice. Ha! Huh, find it if you can. Even if such a thing actually existed, <laughs> there's no way it'd save you from these odds. Laughing like a despotic tyrant, Calia continues to constrict her verses around us. Huh. Lorona cries out in fatigue as she barely manages to escape with her life after warding off a pincer attack on her flanks. One last thing before we begin. There's a trump card hidden somewhere on the battlefield. Tristan. Heaving deeply, Tristan drags himself off the ground after being driven back by a vicious three-man charge. Whoever discovers the trump card will be granted a powerful advantage. If you find your team on the verge of defeat, search for this trump card to turn the tide of battle. Isn't there anything we can do? The only hint is as follows. Look through the sky to find the pur pure purpose of the school. Time seems to slow to a crawl as I close my eyes, letting the tension leak from my body with a slow exhalation. An unending cycle of being broken down over and over again. No matter how many times I try to stand back up, Giving up before this hopeless situation would be the natural thing to do. There's no way out of this. No one would blame me for succumbing to those powerless thoughts. But even then, there's a way. I choose to struggle. A heart begins to build, build up behind my shut out eyelids as I voice my belief with unwavering conviction. Amidst the darkness stretching out before me, a single golden light was shining. Reaching out, I seize that golden radiance in my hand and my, force my eyes open. I see it! The moment vision returns to me, I perceive the blue team stockpile at the far left of the battlefield and the blue flag at the far right. The path forward was clear. To me, blue team! What? Nani? I figured out what the trump card is. Bellowing in the firmest voice I can, I muster up. I can. I muster up. I motion to our left in the direction of the blue team stockpile. Break through to that location at all costs. Hope flickers in the eyes of my comrades as if they, they've shown a light beyond the edge of despair they've been teetering on for so long. This is an intense balloon game for the motherland. Summoning every last ounce of their strength and left in their bodies, the last remaining blue teams charge forward with desperate ferocity. What? Stop them! Don't let them get there no matter what! Surprised by our fierce resistance, Talia orders the red team to pull back and tighten their formation to prevent us from slipping through. Oh god, he died. Barreling through the outstretched arms of multiple red interceptors, Triss penetrates deep into the enemy territory before finally being snuffed out like Red Rover. Hippara! <laughs> what is that? <laughs> With a valiant cry, Lerota scatters the resulting pile up and carries us even deeper before succumbing to the ravenous hordes. However, as for me, instead of continuing down the path we curved, I make a sharp right and beeline for the blue flag. A faint! Though it pains me to use my comrades as a decoy, there was no better way to deceive our enemies, your enemies, by the, than by using, deceiving your allies. Catching on to my diversion, Kalia, who had been laying back to serve as a sweeper, breaks out into an all-out sprint to cut me off. At this rate, she'll block me off from the flag in time, if only barely, but that's fine. Just when our paths are about to overlap, I abruptly make another sharp right, letting her skid out of control by herself in front of the blue flag. A double feint? Mustering all of my remaining strength, I race down the sideline to my true objective, a bystander watching over the game from midfield. <sighs> I figured it out, Mr. Nero. Panting heavily, I double over and rest my hands on my knees as I try to catch my breath. Hold, Calio, stand down! Mr. Nero gestures behind me as the sound of footsteps belatedly converges on her location. Alde, you say you figured it out. In that case, what's the trump card? After taking a moment to gulp down some air, I open my mouth to speak. 
Look through the sky to find the pure purpose of the school. Taken as a, it, as a whole, it leads nowhere, but broken down, it all comes together. First purpose of the school. I tried to think of something unique to the school at first, but when it comes down to it, the purpose of the school can only be can be boiled down to one thing. That is learning. Indeed, it is as you say. Sometimes the closer you look, the less you see. After having after having the first of my thoughts confirmed by Mr. Nero, I continue. Next, look through the sky to find. On a representational level, what would you need to search through the sky? The first thing that comes to my mind is wings. With those- oh, it's his name thing. The silver wing dude. With those two conclusions, driving the final clue from pure comes naturally. Something that symbolizes purity. For example, the color white. Yeah, I knew it. I, well, after she told me, I knew it before he said it. <laughs> At least. Nero can be interpreted to mean white wings of learning. If it's difficult for you to understand, you may refer to me as Mr. Nero for now. White wings of learning. The meaning of your name, Mr. Nero. Is he on our team now? The trump card is you. With not a change of expression, Mr. Nero has closes his eyes at my answer. I must say... The stunt you pulled to concentrate and place the red team's formation was impressive. But instead of confirming my answer, he slowly circles around behind me and begins untying my balloon. Could it be I was mistaken? He's gonna tie him to himself. He's gonna tie the balloon to himself. Watch this. With a crestfallen murmur, I drop my gaze to the ground. Rather than answer me, Mr. Nero poses a question of his own. Tell me, child, you know what deus ex machina is? Yes, I do. <laughs> Puzzled, I tried to recall. I had read about it in Mother's collection. God from the Machine. It refers to a plot device in which an inextricable situation is solved by sudden intervention. <laughs> Could it be? I feel my eyes widen as I look back just in time to see that I knew it. Mr. Nero tying my balloon to his back. Call for me and I shall come. <laughs> <laughs> With a flourish of his arm, Mr. Nero casts his coat to the wind and steps onto the battlefield. Rejoice, blue team! I have come to avenge your fallen! With an otherworldly roar, Mr. Nero surges forward with demonic speed. In the blink of an eye, he shreds two of the red office's balloons to pieces before turning to bear down on Kalia. What in the world? Fall back, Kalia! You can't take him! Quick on the uptake, Erwina orders Kalia to turn tail. You're not getting away, but before she can get away, get far, Mr. Nero catches up and ruptures the fragile air vassal, signifying her life with an impossible swift and accurate strike. To think he could outspeed Kalia to such a degree, even reading her attempt to juke him off, it was unbelievable. Go, Mr. Nero! Woo! <laughs> There's still hope! It's time to tip the scales! Mr. Nero! No longer was the blue team quar quailing at the prospect of imminent defeat. Emboldened by the grand reversal, we cry out in jubilation as our fighting spirits are restoked. This is for my teacher's pride! Oh wait, can I go back? Oh, I did go back. This. Letting loose a blood-curdling howl, Mr. Nero sweeps through the bewildered red team as they scramble to stay alive. By introducing a single new element, we had completely turned the tables and regained the initiative. Was this the fury of a teacher that had been forced to endure to helium induced humiliation in front of his own class? An irrevocable death spiral, utter decimation before long, only one red team member remained standing. Father, you are acting childish. <laughs> we a stoic figure stood as the last obstacle before Mr. Nero's ceaseless advance. Come and strike down their childish father of yours then. It's you. There's no need to hold back. Uh-oh. Coldly informing him she will not back down. And Wena manipulates the mechanism on her iconic robot and smashes it against the ground. Oh, what the? With a sighing sound, the rod abruptly extends to the length of exceeding her full height. Got like a bow staff now. <laughs> Dauntless and unmovable, Erwina brandishes the uninhibited tool before her, adopting the hope stance of a seasoned lancer. What's going on? It can do that? 
Everything rested on this duel between Herbalina and Mr. Nero. Dripping suspense, blading tension. As two hardened combatants squared off against each other, a combat gust blew through the battlefield, rustled the chill air. The moment the frozen air is stored, Mr. Nero lunges forward, precipitating the battle's beginning of the end. Yeah! Edwina was quick to react, bringing her rod to bear with breathtaking speed. With a flurry of strikes, she walls off Mr. Nero's advance, forcing him to step back and block with the shins and forearms. Pushing Mr. Nero off balance, Edwina lifts her rod into the air and grins it down with deafening force. God, she's trying to kill him? Kuthunk! But he manages to spin away at the last moment, barely escaping the devastating attack. The, the ground! Where, where Weena's swift strike, had, swift strike had struck the ground, there was a massive gash to the earth as if it had been plowed by a cannonball. The class could only gape in disbelief. Nope, nope, nope. Content to sit safely on the sidelines, I shake my head gravely at the ongoing clash. Considering she had just ripped Mother Earth a new anus, the amount of control it would have taken to lightly nudge someone like she'd been doing until now was inconceivable. Mr. Nero's blocking it barehanded. Go, Erwina, you can do it! Believe, believe, we believe in you! This is seriously on another level! Moving like coiled lightning, Mr. Nero slips through a Gap in Erwina's zone, and closing the distance with a vicious roundhouse at the temple. But with a red reed bordering on pres presence, presence, pres I don't know. Uh, Erwina steps precisely one half step to the side, striking the blow off course with a brisk adjustment for Rod's back end. Floria punches a squall kicks. Mr. Nero follows up with a ground shattering advance. <laughs> Mr. Nero's was unstoppable. No, Erwina's poise was unbreakable. She slowly retreats as she deflects and evades Mr. Nero's attacks with measured movements, maintaining a flex fixed distance the entire time. Then sensing an opening, Erwina abruptly releases her rod, lunging around under an off-center strike and plunging her hand into Mr. Nero's gut with a counterattack that sends him skidding. She's one hell of a brawler too. Rather than using her superior rage as a crutch, she was using it to limit Mr. Nero's options, setting the terms of close combat, close quarter combat in a way that favored her. Those of us standing on the sidelines could only look in, on in stunned silence at what was unfolding before us. Our humble game of capture the flag had escalated to something far beyond the scope of our imagination. What we were witnessing could only be described as an epic fight to the death. <laughs> Seems like you're quite motivated today. Although he did not flinch or clutch at what where he sustained damage, beads of sweat could be seen trace, tracing down Mr. Nero's face. You have violated the integrity of the children's game by choosing to partake. I will not allow such a fragment to pass. I know you were a prime collaborator in yesterday's prank. I'm not that heavy of a sleeper unless certain incriminating conditions are met do not think you will be afforded any claim to righteousness <laughs> you shall know the same indignity you brought upon me the final clash and dictate of certain defeat could his callous hands grasp the fruit of victory from the jaws of defeat hopeful prayers ran through the thoughts and minds of blue team as they gazed upon the form of the one who had shown them light in the sea of darkness. It seems you wish to suffer the same humiliation of yesterday's once more, Father. Allow me to grant that wish. The promise of certain victory, a decree of absolute penitence. Could her unseeing eyes capture a vision of salvation amidst the despair of sudden upheaval? Yearning pleas ran through the minds of the Red Team as they gazed upon the form of their last standing bastion. Light footsteps, regulated breaths, adopting a Vastly different approach from before, Mr. Nero stealthily circles around Erwina. Futile. In response, Erwina proactively seizes the attack with a broad crouching sweep. Forced to evade or risk being struck, Mr. Nero pulls away with a distinctly loud hop that restores the sentry information being deprived from Erwina. With his position now ascertained, Ms. Erwina pivots with her residual movement, following up with the strike at Mr. Nero's unanchored knee. 
but with impossible deftness, he twists away, causing his the attack to whiff by a small margin. Sasuya! <laughs> <laughs> what is that battle cry? Battle cry's full of spirit that rang out to the beat of his footsteps like a war song. And what seemed to be a last resort of producing disruptive sounds to throw Irwina off, Mr. Nero weaves an oblique pattern from Irwina to strike at her flank. But Irwina parries and counters the attack with relative ease. Rather than misdirect her, it was only giving her more to operate with. Sasuya! <laughs> <laughs> Even though Mr. Nero does not cease his cries, Mr. Nero should be aware of Erwino's aptitude at processing sensory information more than anyone else. So why was he employing this strategy? Sasuya! Over and over again, <laughs> Mr. Nero <laughs> continues to enact the same cycle despite his proven ineffectiveness. Then suddenly, Saya! Mr. Nero abruptly changes his cadence, catching Erwino in a moment of vulnerability. What? Nani? Realizing he has slipped into her defenses, Erwina tries to bring her rod to bear, but Mr. Nero pinions it mid-stride and whirls powerfully, sending its slender form flying high into the sky. He had conditioned Erwina into unconsciously following the rhythm he established, switching it up at the last moment for the punish. It's over! Committing his entire being, Mr. Nero launched deep into what had been Erwina's strictly controlled space. He wards off Erwina's attempt to parry, reaches around and, and under her exposed back and plants a decisive killing blow to her balloon. Hop! All movements ceased as a deafening little burst resounded through the air. Not a single breath could be heard as we stared awestruck at the grand conclusion. Humph, <laughs> my win. Mr. Nero smiles thinly as he lowers the hand that had dealt the finished blow. Three steps ahead of you. Swing! Ah. Uh, what? The shrill sound of air being pierced, something descends from the sky, and impels the ground behind Mr. Nero, rupturing his balloon in the process. The tie? It was Erwina's rod. And I knocked it away? Allow me to quote you, father. After your balloon is popped, you cannot rejoin the game until you return to your team's base and acquire another balloon from your team's allotted stockpile. As I launched my rod into the air before my balloon was popped, it counts as a valid kill. Since I was still in the game when the action was completed. No way! It's a tie. Simultaneous checkmate? Is that even possible? <laughs> Faints. Poor Tristan. Heh. <laughs> even that feeble parry was just to move to... Was just to move me into the proper position, wasn't it? Cal okay. Calicotted. Calculated. <laughs> this means we both lose, father. Do you remember the rules you recounted to us? First off, a team will be counted as losing if all the balloons worn and stored on its side are popped. The losing team- oh, everybody's getting punished. Let's go. But once that is done, the other teams get the exclusive right of dictating what must be voiced during that duration. The rules never stated that there could only be one loser. Therefore, Erwina extends her hand to point slightly offset at her father. Accept your punishment with the rest of us. We could do nothing but gob at it in astonishment at the end result that Erwina had brought about. That means both teams lose. That also means both teams win in a way, doesn't it? Wait, so everyone has to do the punishment? No way, no way! Foolishness. I'd gladly relieve yesterday if it grants me gratification of watching you do the same. Boldly accepting her scenario of mutually assured destruction, Mr. Nero proceeds to retrieve the healing balloon set aside for the purpose of punishing the losers. Nobody could have foreseen that everyone would end up losing, though. Are you ready, class? This is now a showdown of coming up with the juiciest things to make the other side say. What shall we make them sing? Roguish suggestions and raucous chatter was had. But ultimately, eyes come to rest upon Tri Aw. Chris as he imitates a chicken pecking at the ground. What about animal sounds? Hey, hey, let's make them mimic chickens. Cows, too. I want to hear them bark. Look, Noletta, you can do your favorite cat complicated cat noises. <laughs> Constipated cat noises. Remember to push your heart into it, Noletta. Holy. <laughs> now then. 
Mr. Nero turns back to Erwin after completing his distribution of the helium balloons. Prepare to recount the shameful things, conceivable child. Oh yeah, are they already healing him up? You will be groveling on the ground when I'm done with you, father. Such familiar love. Even after their duels and their competitive spirits, we'll, we're still burning as bright as ever. Let us begin! Inhale your helium, everyone. You shall recite everything that the opposing team dictates to you for as long as your voice is affected. With unprecedented enthusiasm, everyone undoes the fastening of their, on their balloons and inhales the gas with heaving gulps. And just like that, our festival of nonsensical noises began. Block, block! M meow! I can hear you! <laughs> look! Look how funny they sound! Louder, do it louder! Everyone's cracking up as much as their own voice, as if they were at ri the ridiculous things they were forcing the other team to vocalize. Ruff off the me wall! Ooh, I'm a cow! <laughs> in a twist of irony, the two teams start competing to see who can make the louder and more outlandish noises. Rawr! What abomination is that supposed to be? Can't you tell it's a dragon? Sounds more like a chihuahua in his death throes. It was a tumultuous ruckus, complete with thick thigh slapping, cackling, and mirthful laugh crying. Amidst it all, Triss seemed to be having the time of his life, enjoying everyone's inanity without being able to pronounce it, participate himself. Hey, that's not fair. Triss gets to hear everyone say humiliating things without doing anything himself. Indeed, it's not fair that he can't join our fun. His carousing comes to a glum and abrupt stop as he's smacked in the face with by a harsh reality. Aw. Um, can we act out the animals that we're imitating as well? So Triss can join us. Yeah, Lorona, you really want to get on all fours and start licking your butt that much? In that case, I'll take you up on that. Uh, uh, so cruel. The mental image of Lorona curling up and whimpering at an abusive owner was so real, I could only, I could practically see the tail between her legs. Hey, that sounds fun, actually. Let's do it, do it. The rest of the class start following suit. Chris quickly finds his calling, wiping the floor with the best impressions anyone can imagine. Manage. His reproduction of a crab, in particular, was disturbingly spot on. The Rona, your sacrifice was not in vain. It ended better this way, didn't it? A sense of calm fulfillment settles over me as I survey the two teams mingling and playing their hearts out with each other. A short ways off, Khalil was imposing command after command on the tormented Lorona. You know you can dictate commands back at her, Luna. Meanwhile, Triss was defending his position of best mimic through four-legged horse race against several challengers. Amaz amusingly enough, Noletta was seemed to be giving him a run for his money all while yelling, I want to eat Cavalieri! If it's pasta we're talking about, I think it you mean Cavatelli, Noletta. Further off, Erwina and Mr. Nero were squaring off with severe expressions on their faces. They were of another caliber, being able to exchange fighting words with such wacky voices. It was quite surreal how out of place they looked amidst the goofy animal noises and chirtling. Yet there was no doubt their presence belonged to the complete picture painted before me. A rising cacoph cacophony of sounds, everyone's voices a cut. Everyone's voice a contribution. It all blends together to create a special song of our very own, a silly song of laughter and dumb smiles guiding the minutes and hours. Gilding the minutes and hours. A happy world where everyone wins. It's for, really, isn't really possible, is it? I gaze up at the vivid blue sky with its big meandering clouds. In that case, let this, let's treasure this fleeting world where everyone's happily loses together then and ending like a transient dream where everyone is given the gift of departing with wide smiles the stories to tell to those awaiting their return back home hey i'm home the peaceful sounds of cooking enveloped in the fading rays of sunset i rest my eye head well, i rest my head not my eye <laughs> against the kitchen table <laughs> Though the enticing aroma tickled at my empty stomach, fatigue always also hitting me at full force. Ooh, 
My breath slows as my conscience dwindles into comfortable darkness. Have an eventful day, Addy. Darkness disperses at the sound of plates, of plates heavy with food being placed before me. The sun was now barely clinging onto the horizon's edge. Eventful, that's one way to describe it. Today was fun in a lot of ways, but I'm spent. On a different note, did you really make cauliflower again? Can't you switch it up and make broccoli or something? You know this isn't a broccoli house, Addy. I gaze on them dubiously. <laughs> I gaze on dubiously. Popple shovels mounds of puffy white vegetables onto his plate. How come we never have snow peas or string bees or something? I scrunch up my face as I push the plate of steaming cauliflower away from far away from my own. What's wrong with cauliflower? Unperturbed, Papa pushes the plate back to its original location. It tastes like water in solid form. Unwilling to entertain Papa's unusual dietary proclivities, I repel the plate with the vigilance of an ubermensch a goalkeeper. What are these for? I know the, I know what they mean, but they're big words. I don't know what ubermensch means. It tastes like water in solid form. Papa falls silent at my remark with a gaze that suggests he was recalling a fallout of our memory. I once told your mother the exact same thing. You know what she told me? I believe that's called ice dummy. So I suppose you would know best what will taste like water in solid form, considering how uninspired your cooking is. Youch. Hope Papa has some ice lying around for that sick burn. Eating cauliflower goes against my beliefs. As its name may, may indicate, cauliflower is a flower, and I'm a staunch pro-flower activist. Even as I utter the words, a memory of our group gleefully plucking flowers by the stream, though, not one day ago, flits across my mind. Whatever, he doesn't know that. Learning to like it wouldn't hurt. Papa pushes the plate back again, causing a strange sense of passion to well up inside me, like the desire to liberate and impress people from their subjugation. The working class won't refuse to- The working class refuses to budge on the, to your demands. We have nothing to lose but our chains. I push the plate away once more and prepare to block his expected return. But our game of tug of war abruptly comes to an end. Papa hadn't pushed the plate back, leaving it to sit forlornly at the edge of the table. I used to think little of e eating cauliflower too, you know. After seeing how much your mother loved it, somewhere along the line, I began to enjoy eating it as well. It was always the strangest thing that seemed to make her happy. A sober ambience took hold as of the room as Papa reminisced. The glorious revolution seems to have fizzled out. Pulling the plate of cauliflower back to me, I scoop a modest portion into my plate, onto my plate. Anyways, it wasn't like I disliked cauliflower. It was just dull. If you didn't defy and rebel against your authority every once in a while. Why did mo mother like cauliflower, though? Munching away heartily, I raised the question of why she was passionate about such an oddly specific thing. Papa watched me, watches me gobble down the food and with a food with a healthy appetite for a bit before speaking. To explain that, it's important to understand the nature of our soccer team. The reason it is a closed world is because the failed mist that envelops its boundaries has da dangerous propriety, property of distorting reality, it causes you to lose your mind to madness such that no matter how far you travel into it, in the end you always end up coming back the same way you came. That's why it's a mystery how my master led the Yule refugee convoy to Sakatrine. Before that, there was only there was only one way for us to learn about the lands beyond our own. Sakatrine's main river, Evaget. However you say that word, fool, Papa nods. I hate that word. Your mother was an infinitely curious woman that was very fond of collecting the unknown land artifacts that flowed down Evaget. Evaget. I don't. Her eyes would always light up. In particular, when we ever we discovered Yule tomes, the reason she loved cauliflower had to do with one of those writings. I remember her words. Cauliflower has a deep history to it, carrying a symbolism in the prominent Yule region. 
represents the mythical tale of a virgin mother and the huge white star that guided the pupil to her child's crib. Your mother always seemed to be talking about things I could never make heads or tails of. Mustering a meager, meager smile, Papa's gaze drove to drop. Papa drops his gaze to the ground. Speaking about mother, he's clearly strained his heart. But I can't stop now. Why was she so obsessed with the unknown lands? That probably had to do with her upbringing. Your grandmother was a powerful duchess known for her cunning brutality. Her ambition and influence was such that many feared her rise to power. However, in a plot believed to be orchestrated by a rival old aristocracy faction, she was assassinated and your grandfather succeeded her. As a spouse of a political marriage, he held her ambitions of his own that ran contrary to your mother's being the next in line successor, being the next in line successor. She, so she, he looked your mother away under, locked your mother away under the pretense of trauma and mental instability at your grandmother's death. Sequestered in her chambers from a young age, unable to ever leave, your mother was made a prisoner of her own home. Her yearning for freedom was such that even when released from the burden, she was not sated, always longing for more. It was, it was not enough. Those were the words she told me, as if the closed world of Socatrine was just another cage. She wanted to escape Socatrine and see what lay behind, beyond. Maybe it's because I've grown up reading her collection for all my life, but... Did you know, Papa? That's my wish as well. Uh-oh. Papa? Tangled not rooted deep in my chest. Can't bear it anymore. Papa, will you tell me? I don't know whether... Don't ask now, will there ever be another chance? Or will I live the rest of my life carrying this aching emptiness inside of me? How? Stilling my beating heart, I forced the words out of my throat. How did Mother die? A desire to know felt all-consuming, like a maddening hunger that could not be sated, possessed me, pressing me forward despite the crushing, crushing dread. You've kept it from me all these years, but I can't accept that anymore. Please tell me. It felt like I was in suspended time, unable to advance, retreat, or even breathe. But even then, I don't back down. Tell me. Your mother was killed. His eyes just changed, I think. I killed her. That was her. That was. I. Oh. The words hang in the air, a heavy weight. I stare blankly at them. Blankly, I stare. I. Oh, he's losing it. This is about to get dark, dark. A dark shadow eclipsed Papa's face, fake a tear stained mask. The stifling coldness paralyzed me. I killed her. I try to speak, try to say something, anything, but I falter. Hollow, that's all my words would be. Unable to voice myself, I let the spinning words fall from my lips unspoken. Gone. It was all gone. The clinking of silverware, the warmth of family, peacefully sharing a meal. In this absence, an oppressive silence constricts the room. Leave the plates in the sink when you're done. Without ever meeting my eyes, Papa turns away. Something aches inside of me as I watch him go. Gazing at the fleeting image of his back in the doorway, I sit there for a lo very long time. The shadow of night passes. The shadows of night's passage sink, sink to their deepest shades before I finally rise from my seat. And you were sitting there for a while. Hunched over a candlelit desk, desk in Mother's room is where I find him. Candle flames seem to waver in concert to his rhythmic breathing press, casting shadows upon the withered books that had once been someone's pride and joy. Papa. Though his consciousness was no longer in the room, I call out to him, reaching out to touch his cheek. The false smile from before had fallen from his face, revealing a haggard hollow countenance. Was remembering her that painful? Even then, he had returned to this room. Unable to let himself forget. You're a weakling, aren't you? No matter, but no matter how weak you may be, I know you loved her more than anyone in the world. Pulling a chair up beside him, I rest my eye, my head on the desk and gaze at his sleeping visage, distressed, defenseless. It looks so much like the 
troubled sleep of an anxious child. I want you to tell me more about her. My words do not reach him. He cannot answer, but I don't... Oh, I messed up. Her favorite foods, the little things that peeped her off. Whether or not she was a morning person. My consciousness begins to flicker wearily as the day catches up with me. Even if it's little things like that, I want to know all about her. Why, even though I was sitting right next to him, he felt so far away. Sarah Fensel. I don't know what that means. Fighting against fluttering eyelids, my eyes find Papa's upturned hand. What type of person was she? I rest my palm in his, noting absentmindedly how soothingly cold it feels. My hand's so small compared to his. What happened on that day? For some reason I was certain. A golden dream waited for me beyond the encroaching darkness. A closed world. I'll break it and be behold what lays beyond. For her sake as well as mine. Raining. Sound of falling rain. Rhythmic patterns patterns seep into my consciousness, coaxing my eyes to open. My bedroom ceiling. However, something seemed off. The right side of the ceiling looked blurry and out of focus. Huh? When I bring my hand to my right eye, it comes away wet. Tears? Perplexed, I tried digging through my memories. Last night, I fell asleep in Mother's room. Papa probably carried me to my room afterwards. I remember, I remember being gripped by a strong conviction that I'd return to the Golden Dream. But that couldn't be right. I always remember what happened in the Golden Dream, as clearly as my waking hours. But right now, I couldn't recall a thing. A gap in my memories. Distraught, I twist and turn in my sheets, trying to breach the thick clouds swirling in my head. But in the end, I couldn't, pro couldn't produce an inkling of insight into what had happened. Huh. There's no point going around in circles anymore. Slipping out of bed, I wander over to the window and place my hand against the cold glass. The mellow atmosphere of a rainy day usually smoothed me, but today felt strangely oppressive. As, as one that relished the feel of the rain's kiss on my face, mist finding me how much the light patterns unsettled me. The rain outside wasn't too heavy, but somehow it felt like the earth was drowning under the downpour. I should get going. Sending the stairs to an empty house, I donned my rain gear and set off in the, into the falling rain. A little rain shouldn't be enough to deter us. We always meet up to play on Saturday mornings. Today shouldn't be any different. The thought helps lighten my mood as I, I proceed down the puddle line path. I want to see everyone's faces. Before long, the Rue's household fall, fades into view, emerging from a certain curtain of mist. What? Something was wrong, though. Standing before the cabin's dark outline under the falling rain was a solitary figure. Figures so still they seemed to blend into the fairy landscape. A knot of deep unease seeks to the bottom of my gut. It was Noletta. Unblinking, unmoving, she was stood there. Noletta. Upon drawing closer, I find her clothes to be completely soaked through. How long has she been standing there from here utterly exposed to the elements? Noletta, it's me, Eddie. One heartbeat, two passes by breathlessly before my voice seems to reach her. What is going on here? But the eyes that turned to face me, they were unrecognizable. I did not know them. Banking and unfocused, they stared through me, looking at something far away, like the glass spheres of a discarded doll. Noletta, aren't you cold? I reach out and grasp her hands, cold, clammy. Her skin had chilled immensely from being exposed to the fallen rain. No letter. Take her inside, man. A sharp throbbing within my chest. I realized it hurt. It hurt to see her like this. Let's get you inside. Gently tugging on her, I lit, lead her back into the cabin. Inside, I find Bressel huddled in the corner of the room, his head cradled in his hands. Noletta had fell in, fallen into a catatonic state, but unlike her, he was trembling uncontrollably in a spell mania. While I was concerned about him, I needed to prioritize treating Noletta. I had no idea how long she had been out there. 
Stripping off her white clothes, I wipe her down thoroughly with a towel and drape a blanket over her. As I go to light the stove, though, a stifled scream makes my heart catch in my throat. Reacting to the stove's glowing embers, Bresso presses his body against the wall. Unable to retreat any further, he lashes out frenetically at the nearby furniture before slipping and slamming against the ground. That's when I notice. From the arms he was cradling desperately against himself, something dark was dripping onto the floor below. Illuminated under the stove's flickering light, his fingernails produced a wet squishing sound as they scraped out more of the dark, dripping dark fluid. He was gouging out his own flesh. Stop it, Bursar! You're hurting yourself! Unable to think of any other way to stop his hysterical self-mutilation, I grab at his wrists and desperately try to restrain him. My efforts only cause him to further panic further, though. Ugh! God. Dang, that made me actually, uh, because the sound <laughs> the... God, this is getting dark. Stars begin to swirl in my vision. As I'm knocked to the ground with such force, I momentarily black out. Undeterred, I get up and try once more to hold him down. When unable to bridge our size difference, I've blown away like an errant leaf. Huh. <sighs> I have to stop him. He's already lost too, so much blood. Rising on shaking legs, I stumble forward again. But before I can reach out, my legs give and I crumple to the floor. Bursal! At that moment, something happens. A pale white hand extends from the darkness, wrapping around Bursal's hands and covering his eyes. I'm here. No letter, no letter. I'm here. Weakly, feebly, Russell claps, collapses to his knees, but Noletta does not let go. I'm here. Where are you, Bristle? I I'm here. I'm here too. Reaching down with her right hand, Noletta tw touches Bristle's trembling fist. As if cast with a spell, the shaking stops in the two intertwined hands, his bloody clawed fingers and her frigid porcelain hand. Darkness is nibbling at me again, biting me. Never stops biting. It's okay. I'm here. Haha. <laughs> We're both still here, so it'll be okay. As if grasping for a lifeline, the two tightly clasped hands. Perhaps because I hit my head too hard. It takes a while for me to come back to my senses. Pulling myself off the ground, I take the opportunity to douse, douse the stove flame while Bristol's eyes are shielded. When I return to check on them, I find the two sprawled out. Fingers still intertwined as they slumbered. <sighs> the sigh full of different emotions, I crouch over Bressel with the first aid kit I had recovered from the kitchen. That's when I hear the sound of the cabin door opening. Hmm? Oh, it's you, Mr. Damalor. As I feared. Looks like it was particularly nasty this time as well. Though his timing couldn't have been a bit more ideal, I was relieved he was here. Can you give me a hand patching up Bressel? I'm having trouble. Having some trouble here. Your hands are all smeared with bloodshot, Adi. So are Shaw and Lettuce. Bleeding on young girls is a bad hobby, Bressel. Mr. Damalor shakes his head in disapproval as he washes, disaffects, and dresses Bressel's wounds. Bressel's wound with practice ease. Something like this must be a child's play for a seasoned war veteran like you. His composure and expertise were on an entirely different level. I am more impressed at how calm you are, staying shoddy. I think Weird describes my situ current situation better than anything else. In any case, Bressel should be reco should recover from his injuries without any lasting damage beside beyond some scar tissue. It had been difficult to tell in the darkness before, but now that I was able to take my time, I realized that there was less, a lot less blood in the room than I initially thought. Mr. Damalor and I spent some time cleaning up before carrying the resemblings to bed and making them comfortable. Talk about high maintenance. Him and now they were both stubbornly clinging to each other's hands. In other words, their right hands connected. We had placed Bristle in a pretty awkward position on his stomach. It was almost unfair how comfy Noletta looked, all curled up under the sheets. Oh well. Letting the tension leak from my body, I settle down next to Noletta and watch her. On as her chest rises intermittently, insert in concert to her breast. Mr. Damalor, 
I have some questions I'd like to ask about these two. While I had refrained from prying too much before, things have changed with this last incident. I am not certain I can give you any, any answers, but continue. I take some time to get I take some time to gather my thoughts before proceeding. Well you were talking like you knew this would happen. This could happen. You knew the cause behind these episodes, don't you? Indeed, you are not mistaken. Will you tell me why this happened to them? Mr. Dambler goes quiet as he mulls over what to say. Explain what happened, I will have to go into their past, which I'm afraid I cannot do. You don't think I have a right to know after this experience? My apologies, but the young master has explicitly instructed me not to tell you anything. I'll have to get creative if I want to parlay with Mr. Dambler. Let me approach this from a different angle then. Noletta spends just as much time under my care as Brussels does yours. My any information withhold is that much less I'm equipped to deal with for this crisis rise while I'm with her. Hmm. It is true you're the closest to on to Shaw Letta after Brussels. While Brussels might have you around if something goes amiss, who can Noletta come depend on if Something happens during the day. For the sake of no letters well-being, I insist that you tell me what you can. I make a point to, of staring firmly into Mr. Damelow's eyes as I assert my position. While your reasoning is sound, and your proposed course of action is indeed the most imprudent, I cannot display an order for, by the young master. There's no need to worry on that front. Papa's already decided to stop hiding things from me. He told me last night he was the one responsible for Mother's death. Mr. Damelor falls silent. With cold eyes, he scrutinizes my face, as if gouging the wall will behind my words. But I don't let a sliver of weakness show. I see. Very well. Shall not disclose any details on your mother's death. It is not my place to tell that story. But I will tell you what I can about the Roo siblings. Having successfully negotiated a favorable outcome, I let myself relax a bit. To understand what the Ruse went through, it is important to understand certain bits of Socrates' history. Are you aware of why the Master's Revolution occurred? No. I learned in school that the old aristocracies had suspected the Yule refugee convoy would attempt to coup. The preemptive strike they launched against the Yule convoy was the trigger for the Master's Rebell Revolution. While that is true, it is not the full story. Relations between the old aristocracy and the Yule convoy were congenial at first, but the situation became strained when the two parties were unable to come to a consensus on one issue. That is Socrates' closed world dilemma. While the old aristocracy had several factions with different ambitions, they were all united in one desire alone. A way to break the cage of the myths that encircled Socrates and Exposed the lands that lay beyond. That was what they wished for more than anything else. That's so. It echoed a desire I carried in my heart, a desire Mother once held as well. The true catalyst behind the Master's Revolution stems from the old aristocracy's ambition, obsession with breaking Socrates' closed world dilemma. The Verlin Ver Ver Masters. Refusal to assist in this endeavor despite having led the Yule Convoy to Socrates was a point of great contention. However, even after the Master's Revolution, there remained influential factions in Socrates and even the Yule Convoy that, that wished to resolve Socrates' closed world. Under heavy pressure, Master maintained her, very, her hardline stance but was eventually forced to capitulate on one front. A research endeavor into the properties of the reality distorting myths that encircled Socotrain. Its name was Project Benair. Its primary objective investigating the effects of Socotrain's myths on the human body through extensive testing. The ramification of Mr. Damelor's words strike me with almost painful clarity. Are you telling me Noletta and Brassel were subjects of human experimentation? Subject O N blank and Subject One B Schwerz Schwerz, as the original test subject of Project Benair, Noletta and Bressel were subjected to inhuman experiments from inhumane experiments from a very young age. They were the only survivors among the pool of children. 
Project Bernard drew from. Mr. Damalor's reveal put me at a loss for words. They're in a sense the reason they seem to know so little about the world. It all made sense now. I run my head through Noletta's snow white tresses as she lies before me in quiet response. When the Yule researcher supervising Project Bonaire perished in the fire of collapse, an emergency containment contingency plan was enacted. Noletta and Bressel were isolated in empty underground units filled with the reality disturbing mist. They stayed combined there without outside contact for years before finally managing to escape. It was fortunate they ran into the young master when they did, as he prompted, promptly placed them under his protection upon learning of their plight. Noletta and Bressel only started living on her property about a year ago, meaning they'd been trapped in a nightmare experiment for nearly a decade. I had no idea. Sensing that her lips are faintly trembling, I brush my fingers against Noletta's cheeks, as if to whisk away the memories of the bad dreams. Not completely know what triggers their episodes, but sometimes they become convinced that they're still trapped underground space, in that underground space, that everything around them is just a delusion they've invented to run away from reality. No letter. I think she's been bearing such a burden for all this time. Rain is something I've started to keep my eye out for, but be careful of anything you might think might try it. You think my trigger was relapsed. One does happen. Don't leave her side. Stay with her. Do anything you can to reinforce that the world around her is the true reality. Understood. Leave it to me. I won't let Noletta bear anything, everything by herself. Oh, a good answer. Child Letta is blessed to have such a formidable friend. <laughs> you really smile, Mr. Damalore. Though it's pretty refreshing when you do. I suppose. Mr. Damalore refers back to his usual iron mask in response to my comment. It made me recall something, a dear treasure memory of mine. Do you remember when Noletta and Bressel struggled to eat anything when they first came here? We couldn't figure out what was, what it was that was the problem. So the four of us held a pasta party with everything we, we made everything from scratch. You remember we made a big mess and called it, and called your grandpa pap for the whole day. It was so fun and so delicious, so much that those two never had a problem meeting ever again. It was all thanks to Super Master Chef Damalori. I suppose that did happen. <laughs> Mr. Damler might be po-faced all the time, but he's actually very good at taking care of people, isn't he? <coughs> I've lived a long time, after all. Suddenly unable to make eye contact, maintain eye contact, Mr. Damler drops his gaze to the ground. A reflection laid within those averted eyes, a glassy mirror, mirror of one regret, one's regrets. It was a gaze I was intimately familiar with. A gaze that often combined Papa's features. The gaze of someone chained by the past. I think it's okay, you know. It's okay to find a sense of family in us. You're not turning your back on the dead by doing so. Aw, oh, day. For a moment, Mr. Damler's iron mask breaks. But he quickly regains his composure. Think of me as family. Isn't that going a bit too far? Isn't it fine? I think of no Letta and Bressel like family, and I've only known them for a year. But Mr. damler has been there for as long as I can remember. That is only because the Coltard, house, Coltard household does not properly employ house servants. There's no one as trusty as Mr. Damler, right? No, well, the young master has always been averse to the idea of employing house servants. For a brief period of time, the Coltard household actually did try to employ one. While they were cleaning, however, they made the grave error tampering with the books in your mother's study. I do not remember, know if you remember, as you were quite young, but you threw a terribly fearsome tantrum. Ever since, the young master has absolutely refused to entertain the aspect, prospect of the house servant. That's so, I don't regret it, because that tantrum is one of the reasons you're so always there for us, right? my perspective, you are someone who has supported Papa and me for all my life. It's only natural for me to consider you family. Or are you going are you going to try and say a young girl's heart is wrong? No, but tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and think of you as family and you'll do the same back. 
Because that's how these kind of things work. You don't overthink them. Okay? Oh. You can be quite unreasonable at times, shot Adi. But your words do not ring hollow. I shall take them to heart. That's okay if we call you Grand Pat Pat from now on, right? Erg. While we're at it, you should try smiling a lot more. You ask too much of me. Nothing to be embarrassed of. Nope. So show us those pearly whites, Great Pop Pop. Please stop. I do not know how to deal with situations like this. Grand Pap Pap, Grand Pap Pap. In, in any case, I will cook up a meal for those two and excuse me, keep an eye on them. So feel free to take leave. Hey, are you kicking me out? How mean. No, but if I'm not mistaken, you usually meet up with your peers on Saturday mornings. It would be prudent not to keep them waiting. That's true. If I kept them waiting any longer, they'd probably start to worry. I'll leave these two in your capable hands then. Leaning down, I kiss Noletta lightly on the head. Sweet dreams, Noletta. Her skin has warmed up considerably since I first found her. Look forward to a big tasty pasta banquet when you wake up. Parting with her, I don my rain gear and prepare to head back out into the rain. Make sure you take good care of them, Grand Pap Pap. I'm not responding to that. You just did, though. <laughs> Winking mischievously, I set off into the falling rain. When I'm a good distance away, I stop to look at the Mystic Cabinet one last time. All of it. For the sake of breaking Sokotrine's closed world. I shake my head lightly to dispel the unwelcome thoughts that filter into the back of my mind. What should I tell the others? Though I wanted us to all be there for Noletta, perhaps it would be best to hold off for the day. Noletta was resting now, maybe getting everyone anxious to check up on her wouldn't do. And it wouldn't also be a big help to have someone some time to digest everything myself. Tired. My footsteps falter at a, to a halt almost immediately after I start walking again. The adrenaline from earlier had long worn off, my, leaving my body in an achy half daze. Too much had happened. It was wearing me thin. Hear me, Addy? Addy? Huh? As I trek through the rain, I belatedly realize there's someone at my side. Ah, good morning, Addy. When she finally gets my attention, she swells with such delight, I can't help but... Imagine a wagging tail behind her. Oh, it's Lorona. The familiarity of Lorona's greeting brings me to such ease, my legs almost buckle beneath me. Eh? Burying my head in her chest, I wrap my arms around her. Do you want a hug? I don't want you to get all wet, though. It's okay. Kai hundred as always. Lorona lowers down and it returns my embrace. What's the matter? Is something hap- Yo! <laughs> when she's least expecting it, I blow a puff of air into Lorona's ear. <laughs> You're so sensitive, Lorona. Anyone would act, react like that if you just blew into their ear all of a sudden. You're such a bully, Addy. Ooh, that was a close call. Anyway, let's be off. We're running. We're already running pretty late. Wait up. Is Noletta, Noletta not with you today? She's sleeping right now. Huh? I spent all morning trying to drag that sleepy head out of bed. Shame, I had a great prank planned for her today too. You shouldn't tease Noletta too much. She's so innocent, she'll believe her anything, you know? Though I know it's an offhanded comment, I shudder at her words. The reason behind Noletta's naivety was heart-wrenching to think about. Well, if you insist. Standing on my tippy toes, I whisper into Lorona's ears. I can always reserve all my teasing just for you. Yeah! Why are you being so mean to me today, Daddy? You should be grateful. People are like onions, they need to be shaken up occasionally or else they go transparent. No, I think the phrase is people have layers like onions. The nice thing about onions is they become sweet when you cook them. Don't cook people! <laughs> Anyways, bullying Leona is fine because she likes it. In fact, I think I'll start charging you for my company. You're charging me a friendship tax? Also, I'm not a masochist. Ah, uh, see, Lorona's panic face cal really calms me down. Her presence had a soothing aura to, to it that made you feel like you are do doing your best. Thanks, Lorona. Our silly... Huh. Tete-tete. <laughs> 
Help me gather the drive to brave the day. Huh? Did you say something? Mush. Mush? Mush, mush! There is no time to waste! Why are we running? I don't understand. The revolution waits for no one, Malora. Oh, I'm so sore. Suddenly taking off into the rain have, may have been a bit ill-advised. Are you hurt, Addy? You're limping a little. It's a pebble in my boot. Don't worry. Don't want to take it off right now since it's raining, so I'll wait until we get to Mrs. Faye's house. Oh, okay. Upon making it to the usual place, we sp spot a pair of rowdy twins splashing around. It seemed it they were putting their rain boots to good use to make the most of the occasion. Oh, God. Noticing our approach, but Kalia kicks one last geyser at rainwater at Triss before turning to us. You guys are late. You know how long we've been waiting here? And where's Noletta? Chris grudgingly wipes off his dripping raincoat as if as we're instantly barraged with a series of complaints. Noletta's not joining us today. She's glued pretty tight to her pillow at the moment. Her loss, Miss Face said she had a new had a special new story lined up for us today. I hope it's a nice cheery one this time. Nope, she told us to bring a pack of tissues so you won't wouldn't soak her nice furniture with your bawling again. Is it too much to ask for a happy ending? Well, Bob, to Miss Faye's place we go then. Yeah, enough dawdling. We've wait already wasted enough time. Let's go, let's go, go. Our destination locked in. Kalia skips ahead and urges us to start moving. Gotta go fast, huh? Sonic. If one were to behold our group from a distance as we went, they'd probably see a bit of a strange sight. While Lorona and I strode along the path like normal people, the lure the twins had other plans in mind. Picking up streams of water wherever they go, they hop to and fro like overactive bunnies. Yeah! No, don't splash me! Naturally, we end up getting caught in the crossfire. I wonder, if Noletta was here, she'd probably be stumping in water puddles, water spouts alongside the twins, dwarfing anything they made. Always imitating people, always so curious. That she was not here together with us, it felt surreal and a bit hollow. Laughter, cries, shouts. I watch on from the side, a lighthouse on the far shore. Under the cold rain of a dreary overcast cloud, the sky, they dance, lively and carefree. They dance in opposition to stagnancy, hollering over the monochrome world with their favorite acts of life. But I was not there with them. My heart was in a different place, sitting in a dark room by a certain someone's side, watching as they slept. Wait for us, Noletta. Oh, what the library? Triggered by the door's opening, a little bell chimes out to si signal that guests have arrived. Mrs. Faye abode it was not a normal residence by any measure. A fact any entering visitor was immediately made acute aware, acutely aware of. The first thing one had ever beheld upon sitting foot in their, her home was breath taking sight of towering book sprawl, bookshelves sprawled, sprawling out before them. Oh, my voice is getting tired. It was no overstatement to say that Pharaoh House owned and administrated Sokotrin's largest library. The large central room. We were in easily dominated the majority of the building, containing everything from recently bound novels to dusty tomes that spoke of ancient history. It was a place that bled an otherworldly sense of mystique. Hello! Kalia's announcement of our arrival reverberates through the massive room. Donk! <laughs> Sound like something hitting wood, followed by the racket of collapsing books. Rounding the corner, we discover Alouette swaying amidst a pile of fallen books with stars orbiting around her head. Oh, wow, you surprised, Alouette. Are you okay, Alouette? Didn't you hear the bell? Alouette had heard her head in the bookcase, so she didn't hear. Wow. Taking care not to step on any books, I pat Alouette on the head. Pat a pion, pain, pain, go away. Wow. Thank you, Addie. Aside from her job at the Morello Bakery, Alouette also held a job working here on her Miss Faye. 
Going with such a hefty workload day to day. She's quite the workaholic, isn't she? They're all out of order now. Turning to the nearby shelf, Alouette begins the painstaking task of reorganizing the books in her, their proper order. You want to help us out? Us out, out. It will go faster if we chip in. Alouette shakes her head. No, can't lend a hand. If not in right order, Belly will scold Alouette. Scold, scold. <laughs> Boy speaks up from behind us as Alouette rather humorously impersonates an angry Miss Faye. I do not sound like that. Also, do not make don't make it seem like I bully you all the time, now you what? Oh man. Miss Belisaria Faro, the influential Harris of the older old aristocracy house of Faro. Alright, I'm gonna have to read the rest of this later. Thanks for watching as always, guys, and hopefully you're enjoying this game. I feel like the story's really good. It's so entertaining to me at least. Thanks for watching as always. What was that word she said? Dapadoo! <laughs> or, or bye! I guess that. <laughs>